Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of Smith Official Agricultural High School. Today is June 11, 2024. May I call for an order and welcome everybody to the Mr. Failing? Present. Yeah. Mr. Quadro? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Dr. Bonner? Here. Please do that. May we stay up for the pledge of allegiance? All set. Yeah. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The mission of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Any participation by the public this evening? Hearing none. Participation by the trustees. I believe we need to this person. Yep. I miss that. Okay. Um, I have one item to share from our latest board meeting of the Collaborative for Educational Services. Heck Academy is one of 55 schools nationally to be designated by the U.S. Department of Education as a Green Ribbon School due to the ongoing efforts and commitment to sustainable practices. The teacher, this is for your benefit, Mayor, I know how important uh, being green is. The teacher, they got nationally recognized. The um, teacher who leads the sustainability practices will travel with the assistant director to Washington, D.C. in July to participate in the national awards ceremony. This is Heck Academy. The Green Ribbon honorees were announced by Secretary of Education, Miguel Cordova. And for the second year in a row, Heck Academy is the Massachusetts De Department of Environmental Protection's Green Team's Grand Prize winner. They are, are tremendously proud of um, these accomplishments, understandably. Um, last week, I attended the graduation ceremony for 11 students in the Collaborative's Mount Tom Academy at Hoyle Community College. It was their largest graduating class ever. Mount Tom Academy serves area students who are not able to be in a traditional high school due to learning, social, emotional, or medical issues. I registered for the MASC Summer Institute in July. The focus will be on strategic planning, collect, collaborative, uh, collective bargaining, Title IX, and crisis communication, and I invite others on the board to join me. And speaking of strategic planning, I'd like to propose that we have a half-day retreat in July or August to develop our own strategic plan. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hoker would then be able to connect his goals for the next evaluation cycle to our vision for the district. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so on behalf of the, the Board of Trustees, uh, we just want to thank Mr. Brooks uh, for retiring in a few weeks from collision repair. Uh, I just want to say a few words and then obviously turn over to Mr. Kayleen. Uh, Mr. Brooks, 25 years here. Uh, you're wrapping up uh, in addition to your time as a student here. There's not a whole lot of individuals, I think, who have the opportunity to go back and, and work at their alma mater. Uh, you truly believe black and gold. I, I, I see that. I hear that from you and about you. Uh, I just want to personally thank you. Uh, if I was to think about a gentleman on campus, you're the gentleman. Uh, you're empathetic. You're charismatic. You care about the kids. Uh, one of your, your big driving motivations over the last several years was increasing your non-traditional students, uh, and that was very obvious. Uh, you care about those students. You care about what they do after high school. Uh, you tell me how they sort of uh, honk and, and whatnot by your house. Uh, that's because they care about you. Uh, so, uh, but also just our conversations, you know, whether they happen to be about the secret, 
uh, whether they happen to be on Cloud State Ramsey. Uh, I look up to you, uh, Mike. I, I want to thank you for everything you've done for the school, uh, for the staff, the students, myself personally. Uh, so thank you. You can be missed. Thank you. And Mr. Taylor, then we'll get into the presentation. <clears throat> Mike, I've known you a long time. Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure as chairman of the board to be able to present you with this gift on your retirement. You've worked hard the whole time you've been here. Uh, being in a clear collision repair business uh, side by side and knowing the trade as well as we did, uh, you've accomplished a lot. You improved your department, uh, the spray booth, and the different uh, tools that you needed, and then gave the, the hands on instruction <coughs> of how to straighten the panel. Uh, today's uh, business, we know it's more replacement than repair. Right. Uh, we actually did a fire truck once, I think. We did some of the yellow trucks. We did, did some pretty big equipment. But the other thing, you're a community guy. Uh, you have put uh, Smith's vocational on the map in regards to Monty's March, in regards to the endeavor that you did to fix up those carts for him to be able to travel from down in Springfield all the way up to the Greenfield area. And uh, your students love doing it. They love decorate them, put points on them, put heavy-duty wheels on them. You learned a lot every year what we needed to do next. Mm -hmm. And Monty couldn't thank you enough. Congressman McGovern uh, talked about you and Smith Vocational and what you did for Monty's March for the floor of uh, Congress. That's, that's a pretty big deal, Mark. Yeah. But uh, from my heart, from my <coughs> peers, from all of us here at Smith, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you so much. So uh, the trustee is there, uh, their tradition is to give a retire at 3 o'clock. Uh, and the little birdie told me that I need 20 o'clocks. Uh, so uh, I want to thank Mr. Miller uh, and our cabinet making students who created this, I believe, a, a masterpiece of a, of a chess kit. Uh, I know you've recently sold your house, again, congratulations. Mm -hmm. You're sort of in the mix of moving south and enjoying the beautiful weather. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you're with Maryland down in the Carolinas enjoying life, uh, make sure you pull this out from oh, yeah. Smith and enjoy a game of, of chess. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I didn't know if uh, any of you guys know uh, about this, but the Hatfield room up there is um, my uncle's the one that donated that son, Henry Betzel. And wherever the trustees, he told me uh, with Miss Carol, when she was principal, make sure that Hatfield room stays with the trustees as it goes. Henry Bessel was Smith Charities. And um, and he instilled in me and told me the whole story about, um, he was the Hatfield guy, so he told me all about Oliver Smith, and that's how I know so much about it. And I'm, I'm lucky enough, I should say, my father's not buried too far from Oliver Smith in Hatfield. So every time I go see my father, I go see <laughs> Oliver Smith, saying thank you for the good years I've had here at Smith. So. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody sign the back of the door. Thank you. Also have a few meetings in this fall, um, and then one of our seniors who just graduated, Grace Clemens. I don't think I said her last name right, but something similar to that. 
Um, she got eight or ten national banners for her dairy handling, and that's very impressive. Um, and then Agnac or Agricultural Mechanics wanted to report that they had much of new applicants coming in and a new Agnac teacher to replace the one who left. Um, collision, collision. Obviously, Mr. Brooks is leaving; he's retiring. Um, but also, Mr. Richards just recently got accepted as the new head of Collision. They have a new teacher coming in. I think it's Jake something or Jacob something. Um, and then Forestry, as you all know, um, had their groundbreaking ceremony. Ceremony, and they really were just getting ready with taking down like all the trees and all of the plants of that area for the new building that's coming in soon. Um, and then Carpentry, they sold their remaining sheds, and they're getting ready for the 10th grade class, or uh, the new 10th graders coming in, so now the freshmen, um, to start building their shed program so they can rebuild and move south. And all of the money that they got out of that, they all got new tools and new supplies for the Carpentry shop as a total. And then um, PE just wanted to say that they had a fun time with all the students and that they think that all the kids really enjoyed what they were doing and bonded with the curriculum that they were doing. But that's all I have. A lot of teachers don't want to do that. There wasn't a lot to say. <laughs> For me, I just wanted to touch on that uh, the sports came to an end and today at 5.30 there's a award ceremony happening in the cafeteria. That's all I have. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the May 21st, 24 board of trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we're having a school spotlight this evening. Yeah, Michelle, the year we have our uh, two of our most rigorous <coughs> programs, most difficult programs to get into for the students, uh, both plumbing and electrical. So I just want to introduce uh, Mr. Plosky, Mr. Lamore, and Mr. White. Uh, representing those two shops for a short presentation on what happens in those two programs. All right, thanks. So, those of you who don't know me, my name is John White. I'm one of the electrical instructors here on campus. Uh, Ray Rosine, one of our other instructors, was unable to be here tonight, as well as Paul Chandler. So, I'll be taking it away, giving you some of the highlights of what we've been working on this past year. All right, uh, it's been an exciting year. There's been some challenges, and the kids have done a really good job of with everything that they participated in. The beginning of the year, we started a lot with a lot of lighting repair, a lot of ballast burnt out around campus. Kids did a good job getting everything back online, bringing everything back up to speed. Um, then, the beginnings of the Companion Animal Building. A couple of my students getting the footing ground and the forms before the uh, footings were poured. Doing a great job. Um, that was a great repurpose of the old stage lighting feed. So we saved a couple bucks on copper on that one. Um, but then Zach Morey and Jared Bear working hard, getting that in the foot and getting all that set up before the pour. And then we got ones, yeah. What was that for? For grounding? Yeah, the ground for the building. <coughs> so the rep, ground reference point for the transformer and everything, that's what that's for. So there's different ways you can ground a building. Typically in commercial, you either clamp to the rebar or you'll put a long section of ground within the footing to serve as the ground. So we just did a footing ground because it wasn't much rebar to clamp to in that footing. So yeah, they, they had to lay it all out, get it straight, get it centered so when they poured it didn't flop out of the pour and end up not serving its purpose. So yeah, they did a good job. That was just one of the tasks to start out. And then here we are during the rough. On the right is Adam Terraz, and on the left is Ace and Layton, doing a great job. These guys did a lot of work in that building. They did all the branch circuit receptacles, all the lighting, and the telecommunications. Uh, Paul supervised most of what was going on down there. Ray came in at the end. Everybody really worked together to bring it together and do a great job. Uh, Roger Malo, the wiring inspector, was impressed with the work. He thought the kids did a really good job. And it was a good experience for them to do a project that size, being juniors in high school. And that's, that experience is going to serve them well. We were able to work blueprint reading in as part of our curriculum. To, to do that on an actual building that they were going to rough was great. Their level of engagement was 
amazing. It was good. They were just a really good group of kids for this job. And I think they really like yeah. it. And smiling to see that. So. Also a great sense of ownership that it's a building on campus. That yeah. Their friends will be work, you know, learning it. Yeah. And maybe. they'll see every day. Yeah. It, it, they liked that too. You're right. It was good. They took a lot of pride in their work. Yes, I should. Yeah. So then winter. Got cold down there. On the left is Justin. You can see he's dressed up for the Arctic. But he, they, those kids powered through it. They did really well. Um, we were all pretty impressed with the way they dealt with the cold. Just kept working like seasoned professionals. So it took a while, but they, they got it. Um, so in between when we were down there, we also did some equipment upgrades and cabinet making, uh, fixing air cleaning units and carpentry, continuing the lighting repairs around campus. Thank you, Tim, for supporting us on a lot of the budget for that. Tim's always great about getting us material and keeping the kids working. Um, and we did explore some potential upgrades in advanced machine as well. They are looking into securing some new, I think they were CNC machines and some mills. We were just trying to see what they had for availability down there. It looks like they would be able to get the two ones they're trying to get, so we'll see what happens. That was some of the filler work. Then spring bought rough wiring of a home for Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they were really happy with the work that we did. We got one house. Next year we also have another house. Uh, they seem happy with us. We're happy with them. It's a good, it's a good relationship. Uh, Pioneer uh, Habitat for Humanity is a great program. For those of you unfamiliar with it, um, it really helps people get into homes. You know, sometimes people that might not be able to afford to, they really provide a lot of assistance with that. And uh, Megan McDonough, the local director, is a really great lady, a uh, nice person to uh, be in contact with and have a partnership with. It's so cool to see the Smith vocational buses at that site. And yeah. Run, and run by they like doing that work. They really like being off campus. Uh, Melanie Chartier, through a Perkins grant, enabled us to get an enclosed work trail so we can operate more like a contractor would operate. Um, and they love the trailer. They, they built shelves in it, got it all set up, and it was really a, a big thing for them. So, so they had a trailer on this site? Yep, oh, they had a trailer cool. on that site while they were working. They could lock up all their tools at night like adults, and that's you good. know, they, they had the material there. It was, it was good. They really liked it. It's was strictly for the electrical crew? Yep. John. We secured that. We got it from Tri Tri State Truck and Trailer down by the county fairgrounds. Well, um, question, Doctor Hooker. Um, is that property we own? No, it's oh, not no, our no, this is the habitat is their project. Right, but that's up near the state yeah. it's near you know, the farms, farms Smithfield yeah. Farms, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So they, they enjoyed that job a lot. Next year, will be at, will they be at this site or at a different site? A different site. Okay. Yeah, we're going to try to get the finish wire, uh, finish everything wrapped up before the end of the year. It's going to be tight. They understand that our year closes out very soon, so they may have another electrician just finish out some of it. But we will be doing another house next year. Nice. Yeah. So, something for you to think about, or Dr. Lincoln, for you to think about is, um, Making sure, like maybe making sure that our students know that they can be invited to the when when the houses are um, <coughs> when there's like a welcoming ceremony for the families that are because that would be very cool for them to okay. be there and see the family that is going to be living in the house and, and for the family to see the students who contributed for. for that's a good idea. Yeah, we might be doing some work alongside that too because the families definitely. Yeah. It's usually during the summer, though, those ceremonies, ceremony, so it's yeah. tough to get a hold so it of it. Align yeah. Them. Yeah. But maybe they could still get the invitation if they happen to check their email or like a physical yeah. invitation in the mail. Just at least so they know that they could be invited. Yeah, another way to engage. Absolutely. So that, that's pretty much that. Um, some success <laughs> stories. All of our seniors who graduated are going to pursue careers in the electrical field. Some enlisted in the military, particularly the Marine Corps, uh, probably one of the hardest branches of the service. And they are all, some of them are also pursuing a college degree. 
you know, pretty impressive group. This was a group that went through abbreviated schedules because of shutdowns with COVID. They persevered through a lot and they managed to keep it together and, and do some good things with their life. We're all pretty excited for where they're going to end up. Um, seven of our junior class are presently out on co-op. Three of the five remaining have jobs lined up for the summer, which we think are going to turn into co-op employment. And one student actually decided to start his own landscaping business with his brothers. So not necessarily an electrical job, but he's a little entrepreneur and he's happy about what he's doing. So that's good. We try to encourage anything like that. So some good things. So looking ahead. So our ninth grade class coming in that we took it through Explorers doing really good. We have high hopes for them. Um, some have already advanced to 10th grade work. They were working on 10th grade work probably at least a month ago. So that's pretty impressive. Um, like I said, we have another house for Habitat Humanity we're going to be wiring. Uh, we also have a large lighting upgrade project. Again, courtesy of Tim, he secured a lot of light fixtures to upgrade some of the lighting around campus. That's going to provide the kids with some good work. And Williamsburg Fire Department. This was something we were excited about. They recently got a new complex, okay? They also have another site where they do a lot of their training. So that site needs power. They're gonna build a training home that carpentry is gonna do. We're gonna get power to a smoke machine, some lighting. Uh, this is something that's gonna take place over several years as funding becomes available. So they don't do a panel. Like I said, a training house with some light, some power. They also have a well. They're going to use to get water to a holding tank so they can pressurize and do this brand. There is another area they're going to build for like an outdoor classroom area. So they're going to get power for all of those things as well as becomes available over several years. So we're excited about it because it's a different kind of job. It's not necessarily a house. It's not necessarily something on campus, but it's commercial and it's a lot of underground work that you don't always get to do. So it's more variety more things that they'll see and that they'll know how to do when they leave. We were excited. We went out this afternoon, Ray and I, to the site and talked to the deputy chief. And we got a good feeling about it. So this will be something we'll be a part of. So we got a lot of good things coming. And I think that's about all I have. This is just a breakdown of what we're going to do with Coffin Training House and Well, Outdoor Apparatus. It's he seems to think he could get us more work in the town of Williamsburg as well, maybe some of the public buildings, which would be good for the kids as well. And uh, things to be thankful for, student enthusiasm, willingness to learn, continued support from our admin and our business office. Thank you, Crystal, for putting up on a regular basis. <laughs> That's not easy. Um, and Melanie's expertise is securing Perkins Fund. She's really helped us to get a lot of good stuff this year, and it's been a big help. And that's that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I have. I'm oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Um, it's, it's topic related. I've been coming in here looking at that light fixture mm -hmm. for quite a while now. Okay. I keep wondering. I keep meaning to say something. Okay. Do we have a story about why that's still like that? Yeah, we can, we can look at it. Uh, um, I don't know if it's tied to this uh, uh, the, video system and needs to be open. The, the library is going to have a facelift over the next year, year and a half. So the lighting is going to be changed out. Yeah, uh, we bought all new LED lights for the library and all the hallways. Awesome. Yeah, it's a project for John and his students. Over so, there. no sense <coughs> spending some time. It was great to me. So. <laughs> 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 so, Tim's, Tim's really good about like hooking us up with work. He's been a great <clears throat> supporter of the program. We can't, awesome. we can't thank him enough. He's really good to work. He's a good partner. And, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Funny, you're up.
I'm Adam Blasky, and this is Army Moore and Scott Patterson. Not present tonight, but he's our third instructor. <clears throat> so, just like John did, we're going to recap the uh, 23 24 school year. So, as far as co op goes, we had nine of our nine of 11 of our seniors were out in co op, and currently 11 of the 12 juniors are out in co op. So, <clears throat> of the nine of them, out of the 11, one of them didn't have a driver's license and he was coming all the way from North Adams and he set out being coming alone there. So um, had he had a driver's license, it would have been much easier to get him out. Um, and with the 11 of 12 juniors, um, the remaining one, we have a job lined up at Brodsky. He's going to be working on some CAD work like uh, Brody Lord, a former graduate. Um, Co-op is huge for us because Scott is, has about 25 years in now, and he's established a great network for us, so as long as the kids hold up their end of the bargain with grades and whatnot, it's easy to get them out. And again, that 12 student does not have a driver's license. He's on the younger side and supposed to be getting that over the summer, so once he returns back to us in the fall, like Mr. Plasky said, we'll be able to get him right out the door. Would you say um, in your industry that the co-op experience is uh, more of a benefit to the student or the employer, or would you say it's it's pretty equal? It's pretty equal because um, they're investing the time to train them. You know, it's an investment for the future mm -hmm. because a lot of these kids stay with their co-op employers when they graduate. Gotcha. Um, I know I will say, though, the union sucks up a lot of our kids because they can't go there until they're 18 and graduated. Okay. So, you know, it's kind of difficult sometimes that the employer invests two years in the training students when they may go to the union club. You know, that, that for the happens. Pay, for the pay and the benefits? Yeah. yeah. And they're a huge employer. Yeah. And you said uh, Rodsky, is that correct? Yeah. And you've got what other affiliations do you have? So Phillips Plumbing is huge for us. Um, DF Plumbing had a couple of our seniors. Uh, Western system, Mass. Yeah, Western Mass Union Cool. Yeah. Moran, Blanders, um, Richards, you know, Systems, Plumbing. What about Cleaver? There seem to that's be, Union as well. There yeah. seem to be branching out more into yeah. pipe fitting work. And yeah. So, so the reason uh, Rodsky's Union, um, yeah, and typically they they can't go work, you know, in the trade right now for Union Shop. But since Mark or Junior, going to be senior, he's going to be doing cat work. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as far as our graduates, um, 11, are, 11 graduated from our program, they received Chapter 74 certificates, they've completed the three tiers, so our, if you're not familiar with our apprenticeship, our apprenticeship is comprised of five tiers, so they get credit for three of the tiers for classroom hours. Each tier is broken down into 110 hours of classroom, of classroom study. Um, so they're responsible for Tier 4 and Tier 5 when they graduate. And we offer those classes here at Smith. Um, OSHA 30, that's huge for our safety training. We do this when the students are freshmen. Um, and Dave Travers has been fantastic with this and works, works very well with the students. And I think, because we were doing the OSHA 10 online, I think they get way more out of the OSHA 30 in person. Dave's interactive. Like a lot of real life experiences to the training, it's, it's great. Also, um, some others, do you have a question? Yeah, um, so OSHA 10 is standard operating procedure mm -hmm. pretty much for all the shops, mm -hmm. correct? For the so, majority. <clears throat> yep. Pardon, Joe? For the majority. Yeah, and so I see you jumped up to the OSHA 30, yep. being it because industry is requiring that more? Well, they're requiring it for foremen, I think, in the union, right? And so the union's requiring it for the foreman to have. Also, the employers love it because I yeah. think they get a incentive with insurance. Some of them insurance. Yeah, I think yeah. they yeah. might get some yeah. insurance incentives. So <clears throat> it's huge. Some of the other certificates we offer um, we do hot works training, mega press training, and uh, 
on CSSD, which stands for corrugated stainless steel tubing. It's just the material we use to transport gas. Just like electrical, we work down the companion animal building. Uh, here's some students' picture. Uh, that's Ruth Sattler and the kids. Who's that? Oliver Cordes and Cade. Mm -hmm. okay. um, these are some of our, uh, our sophomore students. Here soon be juniors. Um, and this is just them working on the rough plumbing. This is the above ground rough plumbing that we completed. Uh, Western Mass did the underground plumbing. And we'll be finishing it in the uh, fall. Well, again, to reiterate, reiterate what John said, this is great because you can factor in blueprint reading, um, the actual install. There, this is a commercial job, so we work with cast and copper for our drainage, copper and propress. Uh, to transport um, the water, the water distribution system, and we also get to test it, which is a huge part of our trade as well. <clears throat> um, I'll let Armin talk about Habitat for Humanity here because he runs the show with that. Yeah, so much like John said, uh, we involved with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we This school year, we uh, will have completed six houses. And working on scrambling, finishing the last two here. I have inspection on Thursday uh, for the, the last couple. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll pass with flying colors and we we'll can relax for the summer. <laughs> um, and then in the fall, obviously, we will be getting um, the Woodlawn project. I spoke to the contractors on site. Um, they're a little bit behind for that. So Western Mass might be doing uh, the underground plumbing for us over the summertime. And then when they're ready in the fall slash winter for us to come in and do the upper rough, then we'll, uh, we'll take over. What's great about habitat is we get to see the three phases. We get to see the underground, we get to see the above ground rough, and then we get to see the finish. Um, and also, he brings students with him when, they, when he stands in inspection so you can see the inspector come and what he's looking for and ask them questions and whatnot. So it's a fantastic house. So, yes. six habitat projects this year alone? Six houses this school year, yes. How many have you done since we've started? <laughs> I think I tried to count it out. I was got it's 27 to 30 houses I've done since I started here at the school. In the six, <laughs> are they complete from beginning? Start to finish. Start to finish. Start to finish. Yep. Wow. Yep. What was done on Woodlawn Avenue? That's the one right over here. That's beginning in the fall. Yep, in the fall, we'll start that one. Um, I know Forestry was over there clearing that. Um, but I, like I said, I think the, they said that they're getting a hold up with uh, something about Northampton. <laughs> holding up a permit or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. <laughs> there's a, a developable lot on Woodlawn Avenue <clears throat> by Charles Park. Yep. Okay. Who is responsible on a, a Habitat Humanity for Humanity site for ensuring that everything is done to code? Is that you? So it, that's you. But also, it's getting inspected. You know, so the North Hampton Spotting Inspector is right. checking. So, right. So, so other adults on the site aren't supervising our students, our teachers are. Correct. And what's that experience like for you? Well, I used to have long, flowing Fabio like <laughs> hair. <laughs> and you can see now that it's very short and very gray. So it's it's stressful. But it's, it is. There's a lot of, oh, 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 don't do that. Oh, oh, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Our, <laughs> our, kid, our <laughs> students are very cooperative, though. And they're, but it's a lot to pay attention to. I it mean, it's sort of yes. the, the adults, other adults help with that, but I'm realizing... Well, a, a, a credit to Adam and Scott in the shop. Um, I mean, the, the three of us, I, I want to say we're, we're a well-oiled machine. Adam does a great job in the classroom. Scott does a great job helping me out in the shop. So by the time, you know, again, these kids are sophomores here that are pictured, um, you know, it, it, it's a great crew, like, like John said. You know, they, they do magnificent things, and by the time I'm out there by myself, you know, I... I very rarely do I say, "Oh, man, we shouldn't have done that. We got to, we got to redo it." So, uh, but it, it, it's a great group. So it's, it is stressful, but it's, it's rewarding at the same. Time. And so you said you make sure they go with you. The students are with you when it's inspected. Yeah, I try to take a handful of students with me when inspected. So, like That's on great. Thursday so morning when we go. Directly from yeah, Larry yeah. Eldridge, who's the plumbing inspector, is a great guy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I give him a pre, pre pep talk ahead of time. I say, you know, hey, this, you know ask this kid a couple questions or ask, you know, ask this young lady something or something like that. You know, they kind of get the kids engaged. He's very good about that. Yeah, that's a performance assessment right there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Plus it's free labor, so it's a hundred percent instructional. We're not doing it for production. Right. So it's a it's a fantastic educational right. experience because we can only replicate the real world, you know, to an extent in our yeah. shops because we're not putting up the drywall, we're not painting, you know, we're not putting down our time and stuff yeah. like that. So and so the folks, the other adults responsible for, the, for this, they understand that they're patient. They you can have all the instructional yeah. time you need. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, nice. So it's actually, to your question, it's actually Woodland Drive, not uh, Woodlawn yeah. Drive. So yeah, that was oh. right. <laughs> I know Woodlawn Avenue up there. Where is Woodlawn there? Woodlawn. That's probably one of the permits. <laughs> there you go. Good, good answer, Joe. Uh, we got the wood right. Oh, <laughs> Life would be I don't, can't see this. Okay, thank you. So uh, traditionally, we always did OSHA 30 independently, and then this year uh, we spoke with the electrical uh, program and we decided to merge. And what that did is cut down on our costs because we're funding this out of our revolving budgets. Um, so we had uh, 24, 25 kids, and it was, I think it was one of the 12, I think it was 24 kids here in the library, and it took um, takes about six days to complete the training. So, um, like I said, Dave's right here. You can see him um, standing in front of the uh, uh, projector or uh, screen. But he's fantastic. He's a former teacher here. If you're not familiar with Dave, but he does a wonderful job. Um, and we, I think we started. I don't remember what year we switched over from the OSHA. Ten to the, we, it, the way this came about was once one class did the OSHA 10 training and they found out about the OSHA 30. So it was actually the kids that wanted to do the OSHA 30 and <coughs> we looked into it and found out about Dave teaching it. So that's how we ended up doing it. It just stayed the standard for us. I can see that becoming an industry standard as well. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it, it is in a lot of places. A lot of the bigger companies are requiring it. Right. That I think the city of Boston flat out requires any public work done. So it's a good thing to do. Uh, so Local 104 is the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union. We take a field trip to the training hall every year. Uh, like I said before, this is a huge postgraduate employer for us. Um, the training facility is right down by the whole mall. Um, right here, what you're looking at are students performing the VR safety training. VR stands for virtual reality, if you're not familiar with that. But um, <clears throat> Steve Bradley is the, is the head down there that does the hiring and whatnot. So we get one-on-one -on -one where we you know, send our kids one-on-one -on -one for interviews, postgraduate, we set them up with Steve. Um, also, you know, we do a Q&A with them where the kids ask as much questions as they want. We go through the day. Um, they're our largest postgraduate employer, and Steve informed us this year that approximately 75% of the union foremen are alumni from Smith. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, what a great statistic. Yeah. So, they're, they're and, um, you know, like I said, Scott, Scott has done a fantastic job networking, and, you know, he has a lot of good relationships with these union employers and, and whatnot, so it's, it's very helpful for us. Now, plumbing and pipe fitters are two separate disciplines to some extent, okay, so, correct? So, the way, so, so I told you before that um, our graduates get three tiers of credit. So when they go to training at the union hall, they honor them as a second year apprentice. Okay? So with this, they get their pipe fitting training and they get their the, the remainder of their plumbing training. So since they've had the three tiers, they can jump them up to tier four for plumbing, and then they can also give the pipe fitting training, and they also learn how to weld there too. So they, they get all those certifications from the training hall. And their training hall is brand new, state of the art, you know, top notch everything. So do you find most of them getting the certification, both plumbing and pipe fitters? Yes, they do. Yeah. Absolutely, and well. Right. Um, as far as Manufacturer reps, we are in close contact with the supply house PSG, Premier Supply, and they set us up with um, Vega, Gastite, Beesman, Central Therb, and Simmons, where they're actually bringing reps into our classroom. This is our lady craft classroom you see on our left, and this is our shop. Um, this is Greg Dodge from Beesman in the green shirt. He's phenomenal with the kids. He comes in, he does, 
he's brought his live fire truck where he's actually firing the boilers, you know, out back in our shop for the kids. And we have a beesman, a working beesman in our shop, a beesman boiler. And so he gives the kids a demonstration on that, he talks about the products, um, his whole PowerPoint, and he's very interactive with the kids. He's, he does a wonderful job. On the left, um, that's gas tight that came in earlier this year. They, they did a fantastic job too. So they come in, they train the kids on the product, you know, how, to, how to use it, joining methods, things like that. Um, fantastic. And the gas study does require a certification. So you have to sit through the class and there's a little little test at the back of the book. Um, so you need to have that card um, to actually go in the supply house, buy the material, and the inspector requires to see that when you stand inspection. If you run a certain type of piping, he wants to see that certification. Correct. So further explain gas type. So the actual material, oh, well. it's, it's corrugated stainless steel tubing. So it's, okay. it's basically a stainless steel that has corrugations in it that's sheathed with a, um, a polyethylene jacket on it. Um, and basically what the, the joining method is, it, it crushes a corrugation to form the seal as you tighten the knot down. But it's, it's basically a much easier, faster way to install gas pipe. So if you say you had to like snake some gas piping above here mm -hmm. without having to take all the seal ceiling panels down, you can do something like that. So it has some flexibility to it. Also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The best that's, way to think about it is the like advantage of copper to PEX is like right. black iron gotcha. to CSST. Think of a vending straw yeah. almost. Yeah. 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 Right. No, I'm unfamiliar with the cast type. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Lincoln. Yeah. Into this. So I'm thinking that. Um, these folks coming into your shop and your classroom is exposing them to the latest in Correct. the technology and, and Correct. the materials that they'll be using in their industry. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hopper, how, 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 to what extent does this happen in, in other shops? I'm trying to think, I, and I'm remembering, I know in cosmetology, I think they bring in like industry sales folks, but how much does this happen in our Shops. I've only been number four years, but there's several that will bring in uh, vendors and talk about products, mm -hmm. uh, trainers, uh, guest speakers. So there's definitely Very a little beyond simply the instructors. Because I'm, I'm thinking that like we can't afford as a school to equip our shops with the latest every year, but what a great way to to expose our students to by bringing in those for the instructors. Yeah, it's more networking. That's yeah, great. yeah. Uh, so, uh, in March, we received a large Perkins grant. This allowed us to upgrade some of our tools to more industry-specific, um, like basically what you just saw with the reps coming in. Um, the press technology is huge now. Pro press for copper and mega press for black iron pipe. Um, so, we got some cordless super hogs, and, which are drills. <coughs> drill bits, mega press technology, so it's about eighteen thousand dollars worth of tools. And again, thanks to Melanie working through this with us, um, we're able to get these tools. And a lot of a lot of tools now are battery powered in the trade, so most of these tools we got now are I think all of them except no oh, everything is battery powered. Everything that yeah. is battery power now, yeah. Hammer drill, which is huge. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, again, Skills USA, I'll let Mr. Lamore talk about that. He's the Skills USA advisor. Yeah, um, I know Mr. Brooks left, but again, congratulations to him. Um, he started the Skills USA program here at the school with Mr. Patterson back in 2003. That was the first year of, uh, of Skills USA here at Smith. Um, and so, again, like I said, I won't go through in details. Tara and I kind of covered that last uh, last month with you folks. But, uh, we sent four students from the plumbing shop, and they swept uh, the district competition. And I was looking back at the, the records that I have since uh, that Mr. Patterson had. Uh, we swept the district competition um, 17 times in uh, in 22 years. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, we again we had two students, uh, our gold and silver medalists from the district competition, competed at states. And they finished third and sixth, respectively. Awesome. Uh, we had a, a, a up uh, from graphics.
graphics, thanks to them, it's in our classroom. Kind of displays all of our state medalists and national medalists. And uh, those are just the totals that we have uh, in the plumbing shop since 2003. So most notably, obviously, the eight uh, national medalists, four gold, two silver, two bronze. Again, we're looking forward to next school year. Um, that's, that's our two state participants. That's Keegan Kachowski and uh, Trevor LeMoyne. The one on the left is only a sophomore, so he plays six at states as a sophomore, which is a great experience for the DJ. Yeah, yes. High hopes for him as a junior year. Yeah. Trevor yeah. plays third. And then on the right is a extensive underground project that our juniors were completing back in the fall. Since it was such a mild winter, we were looking out there quite a bit, which is great. And that's it. Thank you. Sure. I, I, I think maybe for the average person, um, plumbing is probably the most underappreciated, uh, uh, least understood of the shops here, and, and maybe the least glamorous also in, in like a lay person, just mine for sure, sure right? Um, obviously, our shop has a phenomenal plumbing shop, a phenomenal reputation. Um, but I'm wondering about um, recruiting students. So with, you know, they're coming from out in the world here, and are they, your and your shop is always um, full, and I know there's a waiting list for it also, like it's, it's super competitive. Um, and so I'm sure that's a testament to your excellent um, educational leadership, and certainly the reputation of the shop also. But I'm wondering, are, um, like a lot of our students, are they, sort of legacy students, like are there, is it someone in their family who is a plumber and then they look for when they come through exploratory, are you able to um, sort of disabuse them of maybe some of the ideas that they have about plumbing and say, oh wait, it's way more. Great question. Um, I, would, I would, a lot of the kids that come into our shop do not come to Smith picking plumbing at all. Yeah, as they come through pre explorers very few of them want plumbing, it's after pre explorers and I will credit Scott Patterson as he's a fantastic recruiter. Um, so I attribute a lot of our um, interest to him. Um, he makes it fun. He's a you know charismatic teacher. So uh, that draws a lot of the kids in. He's I mean I, I would, hands down he's the best recruiter on campus, no no doubt. Um, but as far as the trade goes, you know talking about the trade, everybody thinks plumbing is you know cleaning out stoppages and, you know, yeah. and things like that. And that's far from it. We deal with a lot of new construction. We show them, you know, so sometimes we'll bring in pictures and we'll show them pictures of what we're dealing with, what, you know, what, like what we saw with the animal, companion animal project. Um, and we explain what the trade is all about. Because what you know stereotypically regarding plumbing is kind of the bottom of the barrel plumbing. You know, that's snake and drains and things like that. We very, very rarely deal with that kind of that aspect. Um, sometimes no. You know, where, where I where I worked in my apprenticeship, I, I never snake trains. It was all new installation and some service work and things like that. So when we had the program advisory evening and came into your shop and you were learning about uh, or talking about geothermal, mm -hmm. and it was just like, yeah. what? This is well, funny. That's, that's also a huge aspect. I mean, with all this technology, the increasing the increase in technology and push the green movement and things like that, it's rapidly changing our technology with regard to heat pumps and, and the geothermal and all kinds of you know more efficient solutions. How do you all stay up on that? Uh, great question. Um, continuing ed. So we, we are mandated to do six hours of continuing education a year. Also, Armin and I just went to a uh, professional development day down in um, Raynham, Raynham. Yep. Raynham for uh, Fujitsu training. So. We stay up, and plus we also work in the trade. So I work in the summer, he works throughout the school year, so we do a lot of side work, so we're constantly staying up on it like, in that aspect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks
Unemployment is not changing their stand on the coaches. What? And on the HR listserv, I mean, everyone's going crazy. What? I mean, it's like, I've been in this position for how many years, and it's always been like this. Now they're treating it as a full-time position. So coaches are eligible for unemployment, which we pay. Correct. So I know that's a huge, obviously, a huge change for everybody, not just us. So our HR director, the city HR director, did have the appeal hearing, and it was denied. So, so for budget purposes, it will be interesting. What kind of impact will that have? The majority of our coaches are employees, so they won't be. It's the outside people that, um, and we've had a few, and they've been awarded it. So, so it's not. It hasn't really hurt us. Okay. Um, tuition, um, based on those numbers, we're doing very well with um, receiving all the tuition from the districts. Uh, we've been in contact with the um, districts that have not paid, and they've been promised, they've promised us that it happen very soon. So, um, I know there's in the, in the newspaper, there's about two schools in our district that some official has come up in regards to uh, sending students here because of the cost. Hatfield uh, brought that up, and this comes out of the town hall meetings or the regular meetings. So uh, Andy and I used to go out and make a visit to most of the sending schools, and we talk about not only the acceptance of the students and the kind of education they're going to get, but also the people that work at Smith Vocational in regards to living in their town and returning uh, revenue as far as tax dollars and things like that. So we've opened a lot of eyes in regards to it's not just sending a kid with a bus to go to school and that's what you're paying for. It's the return on investment that we're able to explain to them. Uh, and then once we do that, we've had very uh, good received very well. A lot of the town administrators that I deal with um, in regard to tuition have been fabulous. Some of them are new to vocational, so it's like explaining how everything works. Um, they'll call it, you know, how much is our transportation going to be this year, and it's like, it's not us. Um, right. So it's, but it's good to develop the relationship um, and just continue to build that. And they do understand that Desi sets the tuition, um, so and they're very patient, um, waiting for that number to come up. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Kaling brings up a great point. So maybe when you're getting these calls and you're talking with these people, you can pitch what Mr. Kaling was just saying a little bit, that it's a return on investment, Absolutely. that it's not okay. just, because they're just being, they have a budget to meet, they're being bean counters, and, you know, unfortunately, that's a reality. Thank you. Um, just some updates on some of the projects. So the companion animal building, uh, should be done with drywall and painting by next week and start putting up the fiber fiber board, the plastic board to protect it. Um, the plan is this, this will be up and going for next September. I know our, I know I thought that maybe the electrical will be back in, but we'll have Orchard come in and, and do the, the final electrical work. Uh, we'll have the retaining wall done this summer. They'll be able to use it and hopefully all their equipment will be in there for them when they get back. Um, Apple storage, we're going to go back and we're, we're going to replace that roof this summer. There's two layers of asphalt on it. We'll put a metal roof on it, replace the gutters, put some gutter uh, 
leaf stops on them, and then that building should be done completely. Even with two layers of asphalt, it still leaks. Um, Tim, yep. do you have to strip the two layers, or can you go right over it? You could, but I'm going to take it down. Yeah. Um, it, it also kicks out the roof. Every layer of roof kicks it out so that yeah. you end up with a huge gutter. Otherwise, it, it's throwing water on the very edge of the gutter. So it's better just to start, start fresh. Um, Do we anticipate uh, deteriorate, deteriorated roof sheathing? Um, I, I don't see a lot. I don't see it from the inside. You won't know until you, you pull it off. Yeah. So. Um, sidewalk repair for the building will start in July. We'll just coordinate that with uh, the other project. Um, we should have that done. He, he thinks like two or three weeks to get it done. And that's pulling out all the concrete and putting it all through curbing. And who's the contractor? Um, the B Alpha. No, that was the, that was the um, Detour Construction. I think they're out of Ludlow. Who is that again? Detour Construction. Okay. Um, let's see. We're going to start the cafeteria work, the demo on on the 19th, where our crew's going to go in and take all everything down. Electric, electricians come the next day to take out all the electrical and disconnect. Um, so everything seems like it's all lined up, all the contractors. Uh, I hope it all works out. Um, and we got some money from, from the city to, to keep going with the uh, metal siding, so I'm going to try to get the MS bar completely done, wrapped in metal siding, and replace that. Those uh, corrugated plastic windows and with, with real windows that the birds can't get through anymore. Yes. Um, oh, they could too. Yeah. Well, I guess, I don't know, I don't know what drives them through it, but they, they go right through it. And the, and the metal siding too looks good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do a, 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 a renovation at Mac, which we're going to contract out the painting, and we'll have uh, Orchard Electric set up their new welding area. Oh, and demo the other stuff. So I guess the kids pretty much have it set to go. I haven't been in there a couple of days, but it should be it should look nice when they're done. So, Tim, I want to from the trustees compliment you and your leadership in regards to your staff. I know you've had some workloads in regards to overload as far as buildings, and you get held up on materials, and then they show up, and then you got to jump on it. And I know it's start and stop, start and stop, and yeah. it's not easy, but. I heard it here tonight from Electrical and Plumbing. These guys really appreciate the way you work together to get them the materials and do the things. And Crystal, I know she uh, finds the money to try and make it happen. But you make a great team, and I want to thank you. And please thank your worker bees for the job that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, the policy subcommittee met on June 5th. We expanded the group of people who would be part of the decision-making team for disbursements of the Michelle Mokrzecki fund. Mokrzecki fund, sorry, Mokrzecki fund, um, which provides for students in need. Um, we also thoroughly discussed the pros and cons of allowing employees to donate their unused sick leave hours to the sick leave bank upon retirement and this possibility may be revisited in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Building committee. You ready? Yeah, um, as everybody in this room should know, we had the groundbreaking ceremony today for the new horticulture forestry building. It was uh, a fabulous affair. Um, a lot of good things were said, and uh, Mr. Uh, Nevin had a great presentation of the Golden Shovel, which, <laughs> paper tomorrow, which was was awesome. Um, the survivor of the of the fire, and uh, this is a stepping stone of moving forward with new construction. As you see, we have on the agenda the discussion of the building vision coming up. Um, with been our, what do you want? We use the term white elephant in the room. Albatross. Road. Albatross, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be my guess, my opinion, probably a 10 year plan, but we, we need to get moving on that, start trying to figure out how we're going to do it, what we're going to do, the whole, the whole deal. And
and uh, I think the clock is now ticking, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, just everything that's been going on here, all the work that the school does itself and, and everything, it's just, I'm blown away in, in reality. Um, it's incredible. And I'm great, uh, great pride to be part of this. So that's all I got. Thank you. Joe, are you up here? Um, if you want me to be. <laughs> Please. All right. Uh, just to jump on what Tim was talking about, too. Um, the summer grounds crew that we hire back, uh, those students under the direction of uh, Mr. Nevin and Mr. Ronsbach, they'll continue to split rail fencing this summer. So that'll go out across the front of the <coughs> and complete that project. Um, so that, that second phase will be done. Um, Currently still sitting at 570 students. Uh, admissions for next year, we had 137 uh, first and second round students already registered. So we're pretty close. We're about 13 away from that 150 number. Uh, currently 36 students are from Northampton. Uh, and we're beginning to backfill in the upper grades that have openings in shops. Um, and then in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll send out third round letters uh, offering uh, enrollment to those students. And CAS testing is done now. I want to thank Mr. Parks for organization and oversight all year. Uh, and as uh, Phoebe was talking about at Mechanics, we are at the interview phase. Currently our candidates are teaching mock lessons or uh, lessons to the students. Um, and that's a great process that we put in a number of years back. So that it's the second uh, phase of that interview is to come in front of the students. So we get feedback from the committee and the students on those candidates. Uh, and that helps us narrow down for our top, top two candidates in most positions, and, uh, and then we go through the final process from that. So pending your questions, that's my brief report this evening. If this 26% doesn't change, um, that's the highest percentage um, Very high in right. history. I think I, right. I look yeah, at the numbers all the way back through the 1970s, which I think are as old as the records go in, in your office, but um, yeah, it's very high. They, they're very consistent, right around 19 to 21 percent, out of about 26 is exceptional. Um, how many students are on the waiting list right now? Um, I believe we've offered admission to 189. Uh, so students that are left is around, is around almost 300 total students, counting that 189. So you're looking at an additional 111. And we'll offer uh, most likely. They're starting to weed through whichever students on that out of that group are withdrawing their applications, or you know because they've chosen to enroll in at a different school. Okay. We do have students who are applying both to Franklin and us, or both to Westfield Tech and us. Right. I saw that Franklin <coughs> Tech is starting two new programs: aviation and what's the other one? I don't know the other. Well, yeah, aviation. Right. Well, that, yeah, that one's. I didn't know you're yeah, that's been in the work for a while. What was an aviation and what? Vet assisting, part of the animal science program. And they seem to have a little bit of a hotbed of the aviation industry in Westfield. Yeah, specialty. this is Franklin, Franklin County. This is Franklin oh, they got a, they got a, uh, cap, skills capital money for for that because of the airport bank next door. So yeah, yeah, right. right. They're going to mimic the Westfield program. Mm -hmm. So that will be more competition for students in this catchment area. Actually, mm -hmm. still, will it start? Are they both starting next year? I believe so. I think definitely one is. And um, we should be able to fill 150 slots. Yes. Great. Okay, so we're going to go into new business. <clears throat> May I have a motion and a second to approve an out-of-state summer field trip deed to be determined to Oak Ridge Farm in Connecticut in the SVAHS dairy team to prep for an FFA national convention. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion and a second to approve the 2024-2025 Student Handbook Update. So moved. Second. Are you going to walk us through this? Yeah, I have uh, Tony Sabonis here who leads the Handbook Update Committee. 
Sorry, folks. I'm Tony Sabonis, one of the assistant principals here. For those of you guys that don't know who I am, um, pretty standard update this year, with a few exceptions. Uh, the first couple of bullet points are just standard updates, page numbers, titles of new employees, things such as that. We didn't update any procedures this year, replace some calendars. We didn't add or subtract any courses this year. Um, counselor assignments, all that stuff and credit um, requirements. That's just stuff that's updated year to year for those of you guys that are familiar with this process. Um, the major updates start at uh, bullet point number seven, which is the co-op flowchart. If you guys look at addendum one, um, that's this document here. Essentially, this is a document that's available on our website. It's available out of Mr. Rowe's office over in our co-op coordinator's office. We're just putting it in the student handbook as one more point of reference for our families. Co-op can be a mystery to some of our families, especially those that are going through vocational education for the first time. Any sorts of information that they can refer to is helpful. We found that it's really helpful for these people to be able to refer to it. Um, Will the print be clear in the handbook? Yeah, that, I, I, grab, I grab that off the website. That was me being uh, Just checking. Thank you. Uh, in a hurry, we'll call it. I'm sure there's other ways to describe it, but I'll call it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the next thing that we have is, is an attendance policy update. Essentially, this doesn't update any of the attendance policy. What it does is streamlines it. Uh, it was in multiple spots within our handbook because for the co-op policy and other things, it was just all over the place. So we took it and we put it in the one spot, just another place for families to find something um, that is important, uh, especially at the state level with chronic absenteeism. Parents are becoming more aware of what the requirements should and shouldn't be. So we want to make sure that they have that in their hands if they want to look at it in a nice, concise way. Um, the the uh, next is, is bullet point nine. This is the uh, continuation of our uh, code of conduct. What it is is it defines out our alternative suspension. It's something we've started since November 2022 with the update to the suspension laws in the state of Massachusetts. Pretty standard language uh, provided by our attorney. Um, bullet point number 11 is the student code of conduct. This kind of streamlines with the previous uh, update number nine. Um, and that's because uh, we took a little hard look and, and I thank Josh Clark, he's the other assistant principal who put a lot of work into this particular session. Um, we looked at what we were actually doing versus what it said in the, in the handbook and we wanted to update that to come into line. So, you know, certain offenses and what that would lead to for students, um, to find it out for our faculty so they had a place to reference that as well, um, and really align it with the state's version of, of alternatives to suspension and how we handle those infractions on a day to day, week to week and month to month um, basis. And then the twelfth and last one is uh, unauthorized use of technology to complete work. This is essentially an AI. Uh, response. We want to make sure that our students and families are aware that unless given explicit permission, they shouldn't be using AI and passing it off as their own work. Um, and in our school, that's big, right? Because you can use AI to do lots and lots and lots of things, both in the shop side and in the academic side. Pretty generic language, um, but you know, I think something that will give our teachers a little bit of teeth when it comes to um, what they're giving out in class and how they should respond to those kind of things. If anybody have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer it. I know Josh would be more than happy to answer it. Um, if not, I uh, appreciate the time. Go ahead. Um, Sorry, Dr. Spencer Robinson. Sorry. I have a few questions. Sure. Um, could you walk us through in, in lay uh, people's language how the school's response to um, violations of the code of conduct have changed since 2022? Well, we suspend less, um, and that's what the state wants. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to fall in line with. So instead of essentially suspending for things on the first or second strike, we're looking at other ways to educate students. So we, we purchased um, PACE Education, which is a training module system in response to behavior that we've been assigning in lieu of, of uh, suspension. We've been looking more at, uh, I, I use the Stanford University um, date anti-vaping curriculum, the anti-tobacco curriculum, smoking cessation curriculum that we've been putting into place. So 
we're trying to educate kids, and, and then we use that also those base modules and the Stanford baking stuff for um, in 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 conjunction with suspension. So instead of having a kid suspended for two or three days, we might reduce the uh, suspension down to one day and have them do education along with that, or education along with that. Um, one of the other things that we've done is we've looked at other ways, such as conflict resolution and um, and mediation, uh, to try to sort through some of the problems instead of going right to um, detentions or any form of it, just to pause it, right? So what we're trying to do is add in extra layers before we hit the suspension in an attempt to educate and veer that off before it gets to a point where we're excluding a kid from school. Our, our overall data, the, the numbers of out-of-school suspensions are way down. Um, the cases, I'm sorry, the cases are way down. Um, some of the numbers are up because we've had some long-term stuff with some kind of anomaly type situations where kids are, are, are a little bit further out. But if you look at the cases, we're way, way down from, from the letters. Thank you for all of that. So yeah. in your professional opinion and anecdotally, um, is this uh, different approach effective? How effective is it? Well, I um, think like any, you know, I guess it's more effective with the kids that are in it for the first time, right? So our freshmen and sophomores, I think it's more effective with because they were never exposed to the old way before. I think with our juniors and our seniors, I, I don't know if it was as effective or, or not as effective. I think kids um, in that, they, they, they almost see it as why, well, you know, I, I'm getting less than I got in the past potentially. But I don't know. That's my yeah. observations. That's not that's not anything hard to add upon. Um, I do think that it, it forces more conversations, which in, when you're trying to educate kids, that's the most important part of it, is to have the outreach and the education with the families and the students to try to um, change behaviors rather than just punitively uh, force behaviors on them. Definitely. Yeah. I, 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 I do want to piggyback on that if I could, though, um, because Tony brings up a great point. Anecdotally, we are hearing from staff or from students the the viewpoint from students that they're getting off easier. So that definitely is a fact for the, for the older students. Yeah, I think I think we have to really look to, not to cut off Joe, but, but I that'll think, change. Yeah, we really need to look at as, as the ninth and 10th graders move up to 11th, matriculate to 11th and 12th grade. I think they'll be part of that system, and I, I wonder if, you know, predicting out is that going to go away, that feeling going to go away. I, I fully support the intention of the law. But of course, we want students here learning. They're not learning if they're home. Um, and at the same time, you know, as a veteran educator, uh, it, it could be frustrating sometimes uh, when I felt like there were consequences for um, student mis misbehavior and it made the learning environment that I was trying to create in my classroom, it was, it was more challenging for me. And I wonder if you, um, what the feedback from teachers have been if it, during this transition time, if it is more challenging for them to, to manage classroom behavior with a different approach or... I think with the juniors and seniors, there has been that feedback, okay. right? They're a little frustrated, but, okay. you know, I think, you, you know, you, you talked for a long time that, that suspensions aren't often for the kid who, who did whatever behavior it was that they participated in. Yeah. They're often to put a pause on things and to give the teacher a break and the kids around that kid a break. And right. To have the con force a conversation with the family to try to get in and provide interventions and supports that can uh, correct the behavior and get the kid back on track. I mean, I think sometimes suspensions get this totally like, oh, the terrible. We're forcing kids out of school. We, Joe and I, since I've worked with, with Joe and Andy for seven years, we've never wanted to keep kids out of school. That's not the end. We want, if at all, we want to suspend in school so that we still have access to them. I mean, today, I can give you a live example. We set up a whole. Uh, support system for a kid who was in our internal suspension room with his math teacher and his sped liaison and everything else because we wanted teachers to relieve of their duties to go in there and, and, and educate the kid. We, we don't want to push, put them in a room someplace. Right. But I think the pause, to your point, the pause is necessary sometimes because everybody needs an opportunity to breathe and, and do uh, their job and do it without distraction and without interruption. And, okay. and that has to happen sometimes. Right. Thank you. So my last question is, sure. um, in terms of, like, to what extent is this document um, uh, understood by students? So it, it's something, how often is it invoked during, you know, the school year? Does it, 
do you do administrators have to say, hey, this is a violation of the code of conduct? Mm -hmm. And so is that the, uh, I'm guessing that that's the first time students might be, come, they're handed the code of conduct and they have to sign and mm -hmm. return the last page, if I remember from Roscoe's experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I can guarantee, even though he signed it, that said <laughs> I read it, we did not spend the night before reading the code of conduct. No, you know, right. we're sort of, yeah. Um, but I'm sorry. I mean, there's five. There's, <laughs> is that perjury? I put so much work. Um, in this, and I'm not. <laughs> but I mean, it's, a lot, it's a long document, and it's the first day of school, and it's yeah. got to come back, and yeah. you know, the form yeah. has to be Great returned. Point. You know, um, and it's a lot of legalese. Like even if you read this, that's not at, written at an eighth grade reading level, which yeah. is average for adults, right? Um, so in fairness of all, but so I recognize all, all of that, and so I'm, I'm wondering, um, is there like a Code of kind of cheat sheet that if you or if you hit the high points with so, students. Oh, sorry. Good question. At the beginning That's of the school year, I'm obligated to go over five Let's points. Start. Bullying, uh, her, her, uh, bullying um, policy, the harassment policy, the student code of conduct, the attendance policy. And then finally, the technology acceptable use policy. I'm required to go over those, and that's what the kids are signing off on. But they, yeah. you know, do I know if every kid goes home and reads it with their parents? Well, some kids are definitely do because they're going to come in and they're going to try to point to page 47 and tell me they're going to wrong, which is totally fine because I'll have that debate with them. Great, I'm glad they read it. Um, but most kids aren't reading it, you're right, until it's applicable to them and they get in a sticky situation or they can use it to their advantage. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure there's any way to ensure that every kid is reading every every piece of it. Um, I'm more than happy to speak with kids about it. And uh, I often, when I'm issuing discipline, and I know Josh and I have talked about this a lot, um, we talk about the violations that are listed out for kids. So, um, you know, parents will request a, a hand, uh, I'm sorry, a paper copy. Bless you. So we will we will provide that to them, um, and it's always posted online for everybody to look at and peruse. And uh, I refer kids to it all the time. I refer parents to it on a regular basis. So yeah, all that's available to them. Um, but like you know, you can hand everybody the book. And it doesn't mean they read it. Right, right, and there's a lot in it. Yeah. And, and that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm good. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I wanted to yeah. say that you oh. know, the uh, the layering of the system. Yeah. I think with the parents, uh, from when, when phone calls come in, that they immediately uh, are in shock that there's, there's John or Mary is under the spotlight. And, you know, why? Well, I think this is this book it spells it out. Why? And uh, the other thing is, not always are the parents involved until a crisis happens. And that's when it, your guys' job gets harder because uh, you have to bring everybody in. So I think, as Dr. Robbins said, if, if they did take a little more time, and maybe during the orientation that you advise that while the parents are there that day to just look it over so that they have an opportunity to be aware of what we're expecting out of these students to be here. And yeah, I certainly think that's where you guys are doing a great job. And I yeah, and I appreciate it. I want to write, I mean, Josh has been a huge help. And, uh, yeah. You know, I think um, he has a great eye for this kind of, of stuff, and uh, it's it's nice to have um, him here to another set of eyes is always good, right? And, and his eyes, which are pretty critical of this kind of stuff in, in a positive way, is, is good to have. So, yeah, thank appreciate you. Sure. I appreciate the time. Thanks. We have a motion to second to approve the following surplus for scrap. Okay. We have a motion second to approve. We had the motion in the second. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Right, so now we have a one timer. Aye. 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 They have a motion and a second to approve the following surplus for scrap from health technology, two broken over bed tables, from criminal justice, 9101 emergency communications manual, criminal procedures, third edition textbooks, criminal justice, action 10 edition textbooks, please talk textbooks, report writing fundamental textbooks, and forensic science 2 edition textbooks. Any discussion? 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, they have a motion and a second for a discussion on D building discussion. So I'll um, I'll kick kick it off for us. Um, I ask for this item to be placed on the agenda. Thank you. Um, um, because I started listening to Superintendent Peterson, I think back in 2014, uh, talk about the, the guys. I get that. Um, I just wanted to provide a little context. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> so, I know that's the thing with him in that thing. You know what kind of teacher I was. <laughs> no, him, that's not explained. Um, so the uh, listening to Mr. Peterson in 2014 um, and subsequent years, and then Dr. Lincoln Coker uh, talk about rebuilding. So I've been listening to that for quite some time, and um, I uh, I love uh, I'm a good a good project manager and sort of understand that I don't sort of I definitely understand education policy, and so I reached out to Dr. Lincoln Coker to say, hey, I keep hearing you talk about rebuilding knowing that a lot was happening with the horticulture building and other things on campus. Um, would you like to start thinking about what um, has to happen, just sort of envisioning what the process might be and what all the al alternatives would be. So um, what you see here, what um, uh, Ms. Fairman just passed out, is a draft of a strategic plan that Dr. Lincoln Hofer and I did. So this is totally a draft for, for your consideration. Um, that I'd like to share with you now and sort of see where we might go from here. So um, so you said a 10-year um, That's just, process. you know, my opinion Dr. Lincoln my head, is thinking how, how things right. move in the state and right. so, how we have no idea so we're how we're funding, blah, blah, blah. I think it may be a 14-year process. It's and you can see, right. like, the first phase would be visioning and, and governance. You know, obviously, we've got the will. Phase two would be moving it through the MSBA pipeline, if, if that is a route we go, and phase three would be design and construction. So the first page here, I'll just summarize real, real quickly, um, is, is that action we've already taken. Um, so we knew, you can see, um, this is all the governance stuff. So like, what, 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 what's the situation we're in right now? Um, so I spoke with Alan Seawall to find out how to change the governance model. So just to gather, this is all information gathering, right? Uh, he said if you can get it through the politics, which would be the sending districts, um, the state legislature, and because all the sending districts would have to be this, right? The state legislature and the city council, which uh, might entail a change to the city's charter or would entail a change to the city's charter. He said probate would be no problem. That's in reference to the will, right? Um, he said that uh, that charter change uh, could come through a home rule petition via the state legislature, which, which would be uh, ratification. Uh, it would take a year and a half. Uh, it'd be better if it were filed in January. Um, and then we wanted a question that to ask him was, could the charter change be a one-off instead of part of that process? Um, Andy, con uh, I don't think you did yet, but was would have contacted MARS, which is the Mass Association, Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools. Um, to learn about the regionalization process, which is one potential option. Uh, what about regional agreements versus bylaws? Still waiting. Um, Andy uh, contacted Heidi. Have you said the last name? Do you want to take over on this? Sure. So uh, Heidi is the superintendent at Essex North Shore, uh, Aggie. And uh, Essex has sort of been the, the model I've been sharing over the last several years about uh, that's perhaps the model that we want to replicate. And just as a history lesson for the, for the trustees, uh, back in the, in the late 90s, um, they were actually looking at three different entities. Uh, you had PBD Public Schools, they had some Chapter 74 programs. You also had the Essex Aggie, uh, which was the Aggie school that uh, supported Ex Essex County, very similar to Bristol and Norfolk. And then you had North Shore Oak Tech, uh, a traditional uh, vocational school. Essex and uh, North Shore were struggling with enrollment, they were struggling with budgets, they were struggling with facilities. And uh, they, quite, quite, they weren't quite sure how to figure this out. Uh, so through many discussions and obviously legislation that was filed, 
uh, they actually joined forces. So now that's why they have Essex North Shore. But part of that agreement was um, the state came in and helped seed some of the money for a new Essex uh, campus. Uh, so if you ever drive by Essex Aggie, it's a beautiful, beautiful campus. Jaw dropping. It's, it's, it's amazing. So uh, the reason I use Essex is they sort of came together. There was some state funding that came in. Um, they have the ag component. They have the traditional uh, vocational school uh, programs as well. Uh, so I, I just see some similarities there. Because at the end of the day, I just don't foresee under the current system how we can afford a new D building under the current state of affairs. I think there has to be something outside of us that changes. Uh, and I believe that entails the state to come in and give us some of that seed money. I also feel that the state's not going to simply give us money for the building, there has to be some type of care, there has to be some type of change, so this doesn't happen again. And that sort of stems from uh, prior to the pandemic, you know, we had legislative breakfast, uh, we had legislators coming here one, one by one, uh, we talked about this, and that was sort of the sentiment, that uh, they all agree, they understand that there's an issue, they want to help, uh, but they also don't want to help uh, solve one problem, and then we're faced with other problems on the road. So uh, that's the background of why I spoke to you. So this is what we under what we know now about the, the governance um, context in which we're operating, and certainly lots more questions potentially. Um, so next was the uh, visioning um, uh, stage or beginning the visioning stage. So um, we met uh, Andy and I met with uh, Senator Cumberford and um, Elaine Cohen, who was here today, her district director, uh, to better understand how things might work with at the state legislature. It, it, Need, you know, if special action had to be taken, which, as we just heard from Dr. Lakenhofer, happened in the case of Essex Tech. So what would that look like for us if that were to happen? Um, and so then right away we uh, agreed to meet that we would want to meet with um, the mayor, with um, uh, an invite representative Sabadosa, the mayor's finance person, the city council president, um, Alex Jarrett, who is the, um, is he the city council president? Yeah, okay, so the City Council President, Alex Chair, and then the other trustees uh, to say, okay, you know, here to do what we just did now. Here's this information. How do we want to proceed? Um, so we had that meeting, and then Mr. Paley knew uh, one of that meeting canceled. So that meeting was canceled. So that's where we have a stop right there. Um, we also uh, wanted to meet with Assistant Secretary for Career Education, Bob LePage, who we heard today how uh, instrumental he was in funding the horticulture building. So the next uh, stage that we envisioned back, way back, what, this is probably in January, uh, was uh, presenting um, all of this at a board meeting in the initial vision. So, so we stopped there at that visioning, and we haven't done anything since that, right? And that, that meeting was canceled. Um, so we're so happy to be here. I am so happy to be having this conversation now in June, right? Um, so so these, are, these are steps that, that Andy, I don't know how much ownership you want to take of these. You can certainly um, divorce yourself from any you want. For, for me, I, I, I think a listening tour and awareness raising tour would be super important to get out to Northampton, to our sending communities, Mass Hire, uh, the MDAR Commissioner Randall, Secretary of Economic Development, state legislators who represent the sending communities. So this list didn't just come from me, also Dr. Lincoln, but also Senator Cumberford. But to get out and talk with those folks to hear what they're thinking about um, vocational, uh, or, you know, Smith Vocational Agriculture High School, its future, what's its place, you know, in the next, or within the next 50 years, really. Um, and then we thought maybe meeting with the DESE commissioner, right, because that's going to be key, is, you know, where, where we are in um, the Department of Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, yeah. maybe then the, the uh, probate process, um, and then finally to funding, which as you can see would be, um, yeah, so I, I guess that would be phase two, maybe, right? Um, so these are all potential folks to talk to about funding. Secretary of Education, Pat Twatlier, Bob, Bob Page, <coughs> Randall, um, Secretary of Economic Development, Governor Healy's director, all these folks. Um, so this is a, this is a, a draft of a strategic plan, right, of what, where, where we were thinking. Um, and then at the very bottom is sort of the wh why we're here now, a summary of why we're here now, which you're all familiar with. The building was built in the 1950s. It's at, it's at the end of its life. It's got four shops. They all need a lot of floor space. 
Um, so it forces a big decision, right? That really should include all stakeholders and the sending communities as well as Northampton for sure. Um, uh, would should the building be torn down and the lease and hold shops um, eliminated so that um, uh, we in this environment of declining enrollment can we sustain the enrollment that we that has been growing? Will it continue to grow? Um, if we think it will, then maybe another option is constructing a new building out of classroom space that would allow to the retention of the 15 shops and all of the academic space that we need for our students. Um, and for that, maybe um, the MSBA could pay 55% of the cost, the state 35, and that would be the incentive for um, some communities to form a regionalization agreement if that's a route that we wanted to go and they would all kick in together 10%. And there might be other possibilities that we're not aware of, which we would learn about on a listening tour and an awareness raising tour of the situation we're in. Um, so the, that last point, that new construction would likely require a regionalization agreement. Right now, it doesn't seem like there are other ways to pay the cost of a $350 million building by that time. I don't know, $450 million. Northampton's 20% of our students, 26 of the ninth grade class, in any, if it stays there, but 20% of the students, we've got 60 sending communities. Um, a capital bond assessment we think is infeasible. The sending districts are already paying $20,000 per student in tuition plus the cost of transportation, and then to place a capital assessment on every single student that will bankrupt our sending communities. I think we can't do that. Um, so this is a lot of information for you all to think about, but this is the, the thinking that, that we've done so far. I'm happy to hand it over to the building committee. I'm happy to uh, continue to play a role if you'd like to. I see this more as a oh, it's great. project management. Nice job. Thank you. Um, but bringing this to you to say, how, where do we want to go from here? What's next Absolutely. for us? I appreciate your heard um, I think that <coughs> Starting the process is definitely important. Uh, we have to get it on, on the board to talk about it and keep it in front of us, vision wise. Uh, I think these are a lot of uh, lot of work trying to bring that to fruition. Could be 10 years, could be 14 years. No. But, yeah, but the thing is that they have to be start. So I agree with that. The other thing uh, that we have an opportunity, and I'll just put this out there, but I would talk about it normally in the building committee meeting. But we have property down back here. We have a building lot that is right next to the advocacy building. Uh, we talked about Habitat for Humanity that we built their building for Plum and Wheeler. We could uh, build a building down there, meaning a house. We could do most of it ourselves. Um, and then we could raffle up for it. That type of 300, 400, 500, who knows what the number would be. Uh, and that money would go towards the D for, for that, that one project. But I think there's, uh, <clears throat> I think that would show to all these stakeholders that were participating in regards to bringing some money to the table. So that's just my own personal idea. But that is an opportunity that we do have that locked down back there. Really. Um, my opinion on this, well thought out, a lot, of, a lot of hard work put in here, obviously. Uh, it's a great starting point, absolutely. And this is, uh, yes, this is going to be uh, one of our prime objectives is start resolving this. Um, it's going to be a long process. It's going to be a long process, absolutely. But we need, we need to get... Longer if we don't start. <laughs> Absolutely. I, great job. Um, so Andy and Julie and Senator Comerford who spent time on this, mm -hmm. main authors of this she's quite document. Resource, yeah. Okay, great. She's, she's got all the um, state stuff. Yeah, you know, no, no, and, and it's great people. that she's she's an advocate for us. Um, you know, her daughter goes here and it's uh, not taken lightly, uh, all these connections are trying to develop and are developing and need to continue to develop. Absolutely. Um, okay. We 
we've got a lot of work to do. So what's the next step? Am I the next step? I, is that where we stop? I, we're, we? we're, we're, we're ha it's happening right here. So, uh, so yeah, Mayor, so. Uh, here's what we're thinking. So, I mean, certainly you've got to provide, you don't have to do anything, but it would be wonderful for you to provide some input um, now yeah. or soon, right? Your thoughts, it's, um, you know, it's Northampton. Right. So it's one of Northampton's gems and tremendous resources. And what, you know, really the question is what does the future of vocational and agricultural education look like in really, I mean, this whole part of the state? It's not just Hampshire County, right? Because it's, it's even wider than that, right? From Quabbin to the Berkshires. Um, but it's forward thinking. What's our student enrollment going to look like? <coughs> You know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, how many shops do we want to have? Um, how are we going to pay for it? I think we have the future drilled down on this. We still have a lot to go forward here tonight with that. So we have this yeah. So my recommendation is to table this as far as putting it forward to a building committee or a uh, ad hoc committee uh, for the future. Yeah. A subset, maybe right. the building committee, a D building committee. Yeah. Um, the D buildings. Yeah. Pardon? I think that's a good idea to have yeah. D building committee. Yeah. D yeah. building strategic. 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 Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Mayor will be involved, I'm sure, and, uh, and all the stakeholders. And Jim, I have to say that you've done a special job here. Thank you. But I think that, as you said, you, with the governance, we've been down this road. Uh, with the studies that were done at UMass and, and all about our school, and the ball got rolling at one time, and then it, it just came up to where yeah. they didn't want to do regionalization and they didn't want to be involved, and everything stopped. Yeah. So I think we've got to get it going again. And yeah, well, is there this study you just um, made mention to? Is it accessible? Yeah, oh, yeah. Have it I can share it with you. Yeah, we have okay. yes. Great. Yeah. All right. So I mean, we got to think so, we need to do a due diligence to listen to what that has to say, continue this conversation, start creating this this deep building strategic, strategic plan committee. Start I have, thinking about yeah. to be on it. I have a proposal to make. Um, I'm a one woman, one person um, uh, policy subcommittee and a one person evaluation subcommittee. So I would propose. Uh, very short term, um, one person strategic planning committee, so maybe from now till September, where I would work with Dr. Lincoln Hopper over the summer to fl flesh some of this out. So meet with the mayor, meet with some of those other folks, report to report the board that. in July and August what our progress is, and then reassess where we are in that maybe Dr. Lincoln Hopper and I would have a more concrete proposal for a path forward once we're able to have some other meetings over the summer. So I would make that proposal that we have. We continue the strategic planning work through the summer, reporting to you July and August, as every time we meet, we'll report to you sure. on where we are, um, and then have something concrete in September, a proposal for the board to consider. Yeah, no, I, I, but we want to assist you. You don't need to be one person. <laughs> well, I think Julie has a good point. She's, she's kind of got things rolling here. Uh, I don't think we need a lot of chefs in the kitchen at this point. Um, I, in my opinion, let her continue doing her homework with, with Dr. Lincoln Hooker and, and the mayor and senator and whatever. And come September, then we got to, I would suggest, we form this deep building strategic plan, subcommittee, committee, whatever you want to call it. I'm on board. So should we uh any further discussion? Is this something we vote well, on or well all of it. there was a hold yeah, on the way there was a discussion. No, 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 so discussion we we can, we can we make a motion? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I make a motion to do what I just suggested. <laughs> should I should I I'll repeat? <laughs> yes. Okay, uh I make a motion to let Dr. Julie Spencer Robinson continue doing her legwork homework on what she already created with Superintendent Dr. Andy and the city and other stakeholders that you 
already brought in and report to us in uh, July and August and come September we start formulating a formal committee to move forward. I motion to that. You got it? I'll figure it out. <laughs> Mr. Kayleen seconded. Yeah, got that. Got it. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lincoln, hold on. I'm hoping that's all right with you. Right. Yeah. Well, in the hearing, there's no option. <laughs> in the hearing, there's no protest over there. So anyway. right. You said you weren't going to be worse. <laughs> okay, so this brings us to our evaluation Please. of the superintendent. Um, so I am going to, what you'll, yeah, great, you'll want that uh, rubric in front of you, and you want a pen for sure, uh, because you'll be taking some notes and um, writing some comments down on your evaluation I uh, need rubric. To interrupt for a second. Yeah. I need to use the restroom. Can you take a break? Take a like, breather or just five minute recess? Sure. Ten minutes. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did you quickly forget that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I do sometimes stand up and go. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Are you taking a break? Yeah. Yes. All right, um, so uh, I want to acknowledge two people before we um, start this uh, summative evaluation uh, reading process for this meeting. And the first is Dr. Lincoln Hoker. Uh, it's the first time that I have uh, led a superintendent evaluation, and it's the first time he's been evaluated as a superintendent. And so we um, collaborated on this, and it was uh, very rewarding to work with Dr. Lincoln Hoker. And then I also want to thank Dr. Bonner, who has had lots of experience with superintendent evaluations and really appreciate your um, feedback and input and gui guidance, mentorship. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, what you all will need to do is to complete this rubric as we move through the evaluation, right, with rating and with cuts. <coughs> so you've already seen this front page. You, you know what the steps are. The, we are going to be rating the superintendent uh, actually, hold on. Look at step five and step six. Thanks to Dr. Bonner, we I made that change today. So tonight will be the summer <coughs> evaluation part one, where um, we will give Dr. Lincoln Hooker will share his evidence on his standards and his goals with us. We'll give our individual ratings um, and our comments, right? And then step uh, six will be summer evaluation part two at next month's board meeting where I will have for you a composite rating, so I'll combine all of our readings together and all of our comments together into a narrative uh, for an evaluation for Dr. Lincoln Hooker. Um, we'll be rating him on each standard. The ratings are um, unsatisfactory needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. We're rating each goal, did not meet, some progress exceeded, significant progress met. You don't have to remember these, they're on each sheet. Uh, we have to rate him on each of the four standards. They're combined into an order, overall summative rating, so that will be next month. And in order to receive an overall rating of proficient, the superintendent must receive a rating of at least proficient on the instructional leadership standard. So what we'll be doing now, I want you to turn the page to standard one, instructional leadership. There are four standards that we're going to be evaluating on tonight. Um, and uh, he... The, he chose one indicator in each of the standards, actually two and one, to focus on. There are a lot of indicators to pay attention to. It's a lot. So to focus on one is much more doable. So the first one is instructional leadership. Um, the education leader pr promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff by cultivating a shared vision that makes powerful teaching and learning the central focus of schooling. So you can see all the indicators under this standard. Curriculum, instruction, assessment, evaluation, data-informed decision-making, and student learning. The one indicator that Dr. Lincoln Hooker chose to focus on is instruction. So do you see that? Uh, indicator one being instruction. And if you go over to the um, column there where it says proficient, you can see the bold um, text there. If you want to rate Dr. Lincoln Hooker as proficient, on this indicator, 
um, the evidence it presents for this, in presents for this indicator, you will have to meet that, that standard there. Right? Um, so Dr. Lincoln Hooper is going to, uh, he's going to present his evidence first on this one indicator and then on all the others. And then each of us independently is going to rate him on whether we think his performance, again, if you needed to refer back to the scale, is unsatisfactory and he's improved, proficient, or exemplary. And yeah. some elaboration on why you rated him there. Like what evidence he presented that makes you feel like this is why I'm giving him this rating. That would be great. And then for that, before we move on to standard two, this will go okay, pretty quickly once we get started. Um, you can see that question down at the bottom. Uh, it, it's really important to me, and I hope to you all, that um, we see this experience as one of uh, reciprocal accountability. So it's not just us. Um, evaluating Dr. Lincoln Hoker in terms of his leadership of this district, but it's also a chance for him to turn to us and and for us to reflect on how well did we support him in trying to meet that standard? Did we give him what he needed so that he was successful in accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish? So down at the bottom, we're going we're gonna to have a chance to reflect a little bit on in what ways did the Board of Trustees support the superintendent to meet standard one? And I invite Dr. McGinnhofer to share with us um, if he wants to, um, how he feels we supported him or didn't support him on each of these standards. So, Dr. Lindenhofer will take it away. He's going to share his evidence on indicator 1B instruction first. So that's what he's focused on, and then more generally the other things. Then we'll go to two, three, and four. Everybody ready? Is there any questions? Any questions? Okay. So also in front of you, you should have uh, the PowerPoint uh, the peanut gallery, it's up behind me. So I just want to kind of give a, a brief con uh, context of what you see for evidence. Uh, I, I felt uh, really the only fair thing to do is go back through all previous superintendent reports. Uh, so any evidence I have uh, provided in this particular presentation has already been provided over the last two years in previous superintendent reports. I didn't think it was fair to throw in something uh, just to throw something in. Uh, the second thing is I, I want to thank um, the administrative team. A lot of pieces of evidence I don't necessarily directly implement or do. I, I think but having a strong administrative team and as a superintendent working together as a team, um, you'll see some, some of the evidence uh, tied to that. And then thirdly, you're going to see uh, the results of a survey that I sent out to all staff, um, 25 respondents, so it's about a quarter of the, the staff responded. And uh, each of the questions were verbatim of the 20 standards. Uh, so as an example, uh, as Dr. Spencer Robinson mentioned, uh, indicator 1B is the, the primary indicator uh, that we're looking at under instructional leadership. You see the response to that particular question from the staff. Uh, so 80% of the staff that responded said uh, that they either moderately or strongly agree uh, on this particular indicator. Uh, other pieces of evidence, uh, just the involvement with the Department of Ed's TFM review, the entire NEASC accreditation process, sitting in on the steering committee uh, and supporting Joe and his team uh, and making sure that we had a successful NEASC uh, accreditation visit. Uh, just the reason I want to thank Mr. Parks and Mr. Bianca with the State Steel of Biliteracy recognition. I think that just highlights uh, the strong leadership and uh, the focus on instruction and the rigor of the curriculum across the board. Uh, both Mr. Parks with the academic review cycle and Ms. Sheridan with the vocational review cycle. It's an opportunity to continue to review all of our programs to make sure that we're uh, consistent across the board and having a high level of expectation. The annual exploratory program and update of the exploratory rubrics. Uh, this was a, a much needed initiative a few years ago. Uh, just making sure that all students have an equal opportunity, equal chance going through all the, all the 15 programs. And then lastly, uh, attending a, a DESE CTE workshop about a year and a half ago, uh, really some updates from their office and how that's going to impact our 15 programs. So those are the pieces of, of evidence I provided for Indicator 1B. And uh, I wanted to jump in and say that, just to put it in like sort of layperson's language, at the, um, so what this evidence is supporting is the idea that, um, that we have high expectations for students here at Smith Vocational, right, regarding their the quality of their effort and their work, that they engage, 
and that we meet all learners, um, the needs of all learners where they are. So all of that evidence, so uh, Dr. Lincoln over asked a question about staff, do you agree that, that that's provided here? And then all these other pieces of evidence um, are supporting this idea that we have high expectations for students. And this is work that Dr. Lincoln Hooker has led. I have a question. On the DESE TFM review, what's TFM? Tiered Focus Monitoring. So thank you to, to Ms. Wanzik for driving that bus. Was that, uh, since I wasn't here at the beginning, was that three years or was that the, was it the ever, the, the bigger one? The bigger one. The bigger one. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And that's tiered um, focus monitoring. It's a special ed review by DESE to make sure that we're following all the proper procedures and policies. So do you want to share your evidence for the other indicators and then we'll give our ratings? Does that sound right? Yeah. All right, hold on. Yeah. Um, so we're under instructional leadership, yep. indicator 1B. Yep. <clears throat> These are the evidences exactly. that Dr. Andy has listed that supports meeting these requirements. We haven't even gotten here yet. We've just said this. That's right. Yep. This is the table, right? Yeah. The, the, these are meeting all the other indicators oh, in right. the standard. So he chose so instruction. Right. So this is about curriculum, assessment, evaluation, data informed decision making, student learning. That's what these are here. Okay. So so for just that one on the um, the high expectations for student learning, the staff agreed that's true. That, um, and you'll also share how many responded to the survey that you put out. Um, but all of these things uh, that we have a state seal of biliteracy. Does every high school in Massachusetts have a state seal of biliteracy? No. I don't think so. So that's an example of mm -hmm. okay. And we have um, these two review cycles built in to our practices where you want to say a little bit about what happens in those review cycles? So on, on the academic side, uh, if the as an example, the math department, uh, when, when their cycle is up, they have to sit down, review all of their instructional materials, uh, review their uh, units of instruction, uh, make sure, making sure they tie it back to the state frameworks. Uh, it's just this automatic cycle of sort of embedding into our practice of review and reflection to make sure we're teaching what we're supposed to be teaching. Same thing on the vocational side. And that's something you led? Through the team. Yes. yes. With the team, right. Yes. <clears throat> so the other evidence, so all, all these other areas besides instruction, assessment, data informed decision making, the evidence to support those indicators are here. So, again, just other pieces of, of evidence for the overall standard one, not only the indicator 1B mm -hmm. uh, that we've shared over the last couple of years. Uh, the annual educator evaluation expectations review, uh, that's a presentation that Mr. Bianca does at the first faculty meeting, uh, just to make sure that all the staff know uh, where they are in their evaluation cycle, uh, sort of timelines and expectations. So uh, having that uh, at the beginning of the year, I think is a great practice that Mr. Bianca does. Uh, the annual mock interviews, uh, again, just highlighting uh, job readiness, uh, elevating that that level of, uh, I, I feel, curriculum on the vocational side. The annual uh, college fair, the career fair, uh, the attendance of the mob of vocational student of the year. I, th I think just simply having a student of ours uh, being recognized there and his or her achievements uh, and their, their success here at Smith Vocational is more evidence of what we do uh, within the instructional leadership. Uh, the NHS induction ceremony, uh, again, for students to, to meet that standard to, to be inducted into the NHS uh, chapter, I, I think, is evidence. The annual health technology CNA program that is put on by the health technology program, uh, the, the level that the students have to pass the CNA exam, and you know, there's a chance to recognize those particular students. The students of the month luncheons, I want to thank uh, the assistant principals. Now, Mr. Clark oversees that. I think that's just another uh, recognition for students to go above and beyond uh, within the classroom and within the shop. The CJMRE challenge, uh, I'm often invited to participate in and judge. Uh, All right, that's criminal justice. Criminal justice. What's MRE? Made ready to eat. It's the meals that you'd have in the military. Uh, so that particular exercise, uh, the criminal justice students are broken into teams. They're given 
a small limited number of MREs, and then they have to come up with a full, like a five-course meal, uh, <laughs> mixing and matching, and, uh, and and then a few of us judge by eating them and judging which one was the best. So, um, Shark Tank presentations also is within the criminal justice program. I'm often invited to be a judge there. Uh, Ms. Fairman's been invited in the past, and again, it's a, another chance for criminal justice students to, to come together. Uh, I think we're all familiar with Shark Tank, the show. Uh, criminal justice, obviously, is not really entrepreneurship in uh, the, the industry, but their opportunity for those particular students is to come up with a product or a service, and they try to pitch that product or service to uh, the judges. Uh, so they learn presentation skills, uh, they learn to research skills, and uh, it, it's quite fascinating to watch this, the criminal justice students and what they're able to uh, come forward with. The Arboriculture CDE that's, that happens in Wood Park, uh, I've been able to go up there uh, for a couple of years and, and just watch uh, what our students are able to accomplish uh, within the Horticulture program and what they've learned throughout the year. Okay, uh, CDE? Career Development Exercise, I believe. Mean. Okay. Event, thank you. So this is climbing and other things and yes. related to the and in the annual horticulture patio judging, I've oftentimes been invited to, to be a judge. So again, these are students who uh, are assigned into a team, and they have to then design and create uh, a patio. I use basically like a rock scape, uh, oftentimes a retaining wall feature. And it's really interesting to see what the students come up with with the design and the, the, the actual development of such a patio. Thank you. Dr. Bonner. <coughs> I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us some guidance now. Uh, even focusing on one indicator <laughs> of standard one, it's still a lot for us to think about and review and you know give a rating on. Uh, do you have some more so rating, maybe not so hard, but then thinking about why we're giving the rating that we're giving. Um, do you have some counsel for us on that, how you would approach it? So just just to, to mention that listening to um, Superintendent Lincoln Hunker's presentation this evening will be a lot to digest. Yeah. And so um, you can continue with the rating process, but this is something that they may want to, they being the trustees, may want to spend some time on. Okay. And you may give them maybe 10 days to respond to you in terms of their rubric gotcha. and their scores. Okay. And then you compile that and give that Okay. summary of the score. So tonight would be a chance to take all this in yes. and then you, have, you can digest it, reflect on it, and then, okay. And, and we, we have the PowerPoint so we can always go back in and take a, uh, a look at the, right. the, the evidence. area of um, right. evidence. Yeah. Okay. I agree because I think it is a lot to do. Yeah. Yes. And I want to be fair uh, with the superintendent and not uh, rush this. So I, I concur with you. Um, so this is this is evidence of his instructional leadership. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. but there's still yeah. two more pages. Two more pages before <laughs> he yeah. goes to the next yeah. indicator. Okay. So those are. I, are you okay. going going to necessarily read every question, or we can read them? You you sum up when you say <laughs> it's not my strongly agree. That's it. Right. So the next slide, uh, Mr. Quadro, that you're referring to are the. The rest of the survey. All questions. right, hold on before you go there. Um, and seeing this is obviously my first time doing this, and I need to be educated and learn mm -hmm. the process. I'm looking at this on this lower other evidence or standard. Okay, all these things here of participating in. Um, I guess I just cut. That. I don't see how this is instructional leadership in a way. Um, so, so I guess through the process, yeah. I will start to understand. So I have a question for the trustee. So when the goals were established, mm -hmm. as well as the identified indicators, did you also set benchmarks as to what you were expecting for each goal, and that's what you should be looking at? We did for the goals to a certain extent, and not for the standards. Not for the standards. Yeah. Okay, because it could, I mean, this is, 
this is just basic work every day. Yeah. There are some much extra things that have been done here, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you don't want to be overwhelmed. This is true. So, um, why don't we just allow the superintendent to do his presentation yeah. and just listen to the points and the pieces, and then take some time to go through this ourselves. Uh, you know, have give us that time frame of ten days, and yeah. then we can return the information to you. And so I'm hearing you say that um, the, we'll be starting the next round of evaluate, evaluation round in August or September. And so to be, and you'll be here with us, which will be great, um, but to, that if we had been more specific with the indicator about what that would look like, to us, we did that with the goals, but not with indicators. Right. That we would have a better sense of how the, the evidence matches. Correct. We would have been able to our streamline. This, this, right. is, this is what we're yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll be thinking. So we'll. This is our first time doing it, and so we'll say for this, this time we'll look generally at instructional leadership. These are the all, all that whole area of instructional leadership that this means in terms of his. You know, high expectations for students. That's the evidence. How, how do we, we're going to keep it kind of gentle this right. first time. And we'll do that. <coughs> so, where do we go from here? The, uh, the survey questions for number one, and then we'll do two, three, four. We'll look at the goals, and then we'll look at the guesses. Okay. So, are we just going to do this one tonight? No. You're going to go off. Oh. All right. Lots of work. Um, okay. I think that's too much. Okay. I do um, How about we do half of them? How about we do one, two? How could we? I mean, I mean this, this. It's been a collaborative product, pro process after the cover. Um, we could streamline tonight. To, to get through the four and the three, or we can split it up. What, what's your preference? Well, perhaps we at least review the focus <laughs> indicators, so yeah. the one per yeah. four standards. Yeah. Uh, I won't even bother focusing on the other evidence for each of the standards. I think that might be overwhelming. I agree. I but I could at least touch on the survey questions, I think, is some evidence from the staff to show overall. Uh, I yeah, want, I, I would. I want to focus on the other evidence. Okay. I think that might be the, the part of the or, or maybe, you, right, so for the other evidence, and maybe with the indicators that you're focusing on, maybe pull out one or two examples that you feel like really support your mm -hmm. leadership. Okay. So under okay. instructional leadership, the, the first standard. Yeah. Uh, so again, we focused on indicator 1B. Yeah. We reviewed that evidence, we reviewed the survey question to get 80%, either moderately or strongly agreed. But there are three other indicators. Again, we we're focusing on them, uh, but there were survey questions to the staff. And that's that slide that you see the three survey responses. When you look at all four survey questions for all four in, uh, indicators of the instructional leadership, overall, 88% of the respondents either moderately or strongly agreed. We are at least proficient in instructional leadership. So you see those other three survey questions; those are verbatim of the other indicators that we're not focusing on. Okay, that was some of the other evidence that we're skipping over, but tied to those, those other three questions. So, so as an example, the stu superintendent provides effective and timely supervision and evaluation of all staff in alignment with regulations and contract provisions. Um, that's so that is the <coughs> is evaluation under standard one, right? Um, I see that you noted the responses for each one, right? Is it 25 percent? 25 responses? across the board, so um, it's about 25 percent of the staff, yeah. yeah. Okay, and this was sent the surveys were sent out to um, teachers to all, all staff, all staff. Yeah. Okay. right? All right, so should we move on to management operations standard two? Oh, I'm sorry, there's actually. Okay. Five questions. So the, the next slide is okay. the, the additional question. Gotcha. Follow next to that. So yes, management operations. But you. So when you have that um, 
the 80% of staff moderately strongly agreed. That is just for that indicator, right? Uh, instructional leadership yeah. standard. The I mean, is that, is that for the... So there's five indicators that fall under instructional leadership. Right, but so at the... Oh, other, that for, that's yeah. only for the first one. Yeah. That's the focus one. Yes. So that's so that we can that's that's we also have, helpful just to be like eighty percent of the staff agree that, that on that, focus, on right. that indicator because we're just going to be focused on the indicators in our how we, in our meetings. Okay. So now um, standard two, right, which is management operations, ensuring a safe, effective, and efficient staff learning environment using resources to implement appropriate curriculum, staffing, and scheduling. So that's environment, human resources, law, ethics, policy, scheduling, fiscal systems. Then Dr. Lincoln Hooker chose indicator 2A, the environment to focus on. Which is to develop oh, sorry, and execute TMT, effective right? plans, procedures, mm -hmm. routines, operational systems to address a full range of safety, mm -hmm. health, and emotional and social needs of students throughout the district. So the particular survey uh, question that pertains to that particular focus indicator, uh, that question came back with 96% of the staff either moderately or strongly agreeing. And then evidence I have shared over the last two years uh, that I, I felt at least were related to this particular focus indicator. Uh, again, all of the work that we've been doing with the new horticulture building, uh, getting through that entire process, the campaign animal building design and construction, the animal science building uh, redesign and renovation, Pocket Pet Lab design and construction, getting the policy subcommittee meetings back up and running, and then having policy submitted to the board, uh, the weekly leadership meetings, participating and sitting in with uh, Mr. Bianca's uh, bat meetings, the successful fire drills and Alice training, and then uh, the annual summer admin planning retreat that the admin does uh, over the summer planning. All right, I'm weak on my acronyms. <laughs> What's out? It's, it's an acronym that uh, for basically active threat on campus. So okay. Uh, All right. Active threat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No, active threat. That's good enough. Thank you. That is building administrative team. And um, Dr. Lincoln Hoker, um, the you also focus on indicator two D. I think that was the you had a goal, goal, goal. For. The okay. goal. Uh, that's later. That's so we so we won't um, right. So I think that's why I pulled it out in the okay. Gotcha. Great. All right. I'm getting to understand what we're doing, but what confuses me is, okay, we got these standards. Yeah. This one, we're on management and operations. Yeah. We have all these indicators that fall under this topic. Yeah. Essentially, and, his responsibilities in okay. the area of management and operations. Exactly. All right. Yeah. And so for this purpose, we're focusing on this environmental. Just environment. Environment, yeah. okay. And so, how is this developed? Is this in house? Is this coming from three guesses? The state. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But All we right. are not required to use this. What the so state offers it as model as and and the Massachusetts MASC also was a resource in yeah. this. So okay. That they support the use of the state developed rubric. But unlike with everybody else in this district that has to use the state evaluation, we don't have to with the superintendent. We can make up our own. <coughs> okay. Which is kind of interesting to think about. Um, nobody else here is evaluated in public and the superintendent is. It's really different from every other position. But it's something for us to think about. Like, no, if we don't like this rubric if it's a lot. If we would like to develop our own evaluation Well, process, this gives <laughs> us a working, a working yeah. document starting it's point. It's a lot. Yeah, it's, okay. It well, let's let's try to work with it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So, focusing on the environment. Yes. And so and and so that, you know, the, the environment is promoting that this one piece of management operation, right? Promoting the learning and growth of all students by and staff by ensuring a safe, efficient, effective learning environment. Yeah. Okay. Curriculum staffing saves it. even that one indicator is a lot in it, right? It, but this is, yeah. for me, this is, uh, it's it's easier for me to relate the evidence that he's provided. Right. 
right. that. I'm like, oh yeah, I can put like, all of Yeah, no. That's all Okay, that. I'm getting it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, quick question. Uh, the school help, um, you neglected to add that, but that's a significant bonus for you. So I'm just going to add it. Okay. <laughs> all right. The, the, <laughs> the, the, not quite um, the running out, but yes. Yeah, the medical, the, um, right. the school-based school school health, health center. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. The community, what's it called? The health, 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 health. Okay. Good job, Dr. Okay. Okay, All right, on. Uh, hold on. There's a good point you bring up, but that, that in a sense, fell in our lap, in a sense. Did you, did no. Dr. Andy, seek it out? Tons of work. Work that's yeah. Outreach to bring it here, or didn't they approach us? Oh, to begin with. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they approached us, thought it was a good idea. Yeah. And the point of getting at, he didn't seek it necessarily. Right. And I'm not trying to put him down in any way. Understood. But, uh, but help, certainly, the, the opportunity presented itself made it happen. I would say, I would push back a little bit and say that there are probably many super, I don't know, other people in his position, if they were presented with this opportunity, they would say, I've got a lot going yeah. on. I can't, I can't do I this. Can't. Yeah. Also, no, um, well taken. the uh, direct executive director, Eliza Lick was the executive director of it, so she left that role and somebody else came on board, so then he had to form a new relationship yeah. with this other person. We did a site visit to Gateway to see their health center so that he could see what it, we could see what it looked like and ask lots of questions right, about how right, it right. Um, And he, I don't know how many meetings you had um, with that. He had have so many meetings with them, he's showing them the site, and he's, you had to secure some funding for to support their securing them the funding for all the legal things that he had to work out where um, insurance, like families insurance pays for the students to receive the services. So that had to be, so all that happened. Yeah, that, yeah, well, yeah. Really were a bit, yeah. that originally the, the concept had been that they were going to build a building or build onto a building, right. Right. and then that wasn't going to work. So mm -hmm. then Dr. Mm -hmm. McInnocker had to kind of come up with another no, solution. No. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's good that you just kicked off this uh, response. That's great to allow how to change well, that's where I, right. Yeah. right, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No. Excellent. So we're going to skip the other evidence, Correct. and I, I would propose that we skip the, question, the questions. I think it's easy to survey questions. I think these are easy to understand and look at the pie chart. Yeah, for sure. So then we're at, now we're at the third standard. We're at three out of four. Um, and this is probably, they start with instructional leadership, which can be the hardest to understand, especially with a superintendent to see that direct form. Um, so family and community engagement. So please. So to the laws, ethics, and policy, that's the, that's a goal. Exactly. Yeah. So it's so we're not looking at that now. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Because I, I had it there so that we could see the proficient language related to the goal. Under, to understand what that meant. Okay. Um, which next time we do this, we'll be more focused. Uh, so standard three, family and community engagement promotes learning and growth of all students, the success of all staff through effective partnerships with families, community organizations, and other stakeholders that support their mission. Um, so Dr. Lincoln Hooker focused on, uh, so the indicators are engagement, sharing responsibility, communication, and family concerns. He focused on communication. Uh, which is to engage in regular two-way, culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance. Um, so again, to kick this particular Focus indicator off. You'll see you, you see the, the survey results for that particular indicator from the staff. Ninety-two percent of the respondents said that they either moderately or strongly agree. And then evidence I have shared over the last two years uh, to the board included the monthly newsletters that go out to the school community. Uh, here is the school-based health center consulting on the potential school-based health center services. That communication back and forth. Uh, monthly Connecticut Valley Superintendent Roundtable Luncheons uh, with Hampshire County uh, Superintendents. The annual MAAC Day on the Hill Advocacy. Uh, the MDAR consult, uh, consultations at MDAR is the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. Uh, I've been working with them uh, on some consulting work that they've had going on around the state. 
Uh, I've been a Mass Hire Executive Board member, uh, consulting, as, as we talked earlier, uh, in a meeting, the Senator Comerford consultation on fee building, attending the, uh, the Mayor City Department head meetings, the biannual program advisory dinner and, and meetings, and then a presentation with Mr. Kayleen uh, with the Northampton Lions Club presentation about a year ago. So these, this is all evidence of the superintendent engaging mm -hmm. with community state yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. And this one seems to understand. Yeah. 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 So we're not going to look at the other evidence for um, shared responsibility, family concerns, and engagement. But it's mm -hmm. there for us to refer to. Right. So in, in my rep from my point of view, you can re review them. I think there's obviously overlap with a lot of these. Yeah. I try to differentiate what you see on, as other evidence, as events or opportunities I was part of, but I didn't really directly interact as more of a participant. Right. Okay. Uh, where the other, you know, the, the focus indicator, I was more of a, an active participant, directly yeah. engaging back and forth. Yeah. Initiating some things. Yeah. All right. I, um, this first one, ask under other evidence, ask in property management luncheon. What was that all about? Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Bianchi, for organizing that. Um, so, Aspen Property Management is a very large property management company. Yeah, I know. Yep. By Mr. Uh, Rinspoon. They actually wanted to reach out and try okay. to make a connection with some of our educational programs, <laughs> uh, students, uh, and try to again, create that job pipeline. Right, uh, right, right. I, I, I got it now. Thank you. So standard four. Um, so standard fours are the last standard professional culture. Uh, superintendent promotes success for, for all students by nurturing and sustaining a school culture of reflective practice, high expectations, and continuous learning for staff. It includes these indicators: a commitment to high standards. Uh, so this is with the staff versus with the students in the first one, right? Uh, cultural proficiency, communications, continuous learning shared vision, and managing conflict. And the indicator that the superintendent chose to focus on is um, communications. Which is to utilize strong interpersonal written and verbal communication skills to constantly and effectively communicate with stakeholders. Uh, so the, the particular survey question that pertains to this focus indicator, uh, the respondents, that 96% of the respondents either moderately or surroundingly agreed. And uh, three pieces of evidence I've shared over the last couple of years uh, is the annual state of school presentations I give to the, the faculty going into the budget season uh, and then share with the, the trustees, sort of looking ahead and you know, headwinds that we may have and successes and sort of the direction that we're going in the school. Uh, I've been a MAVA officer over the last several years and uh, as part of that role, uh, I've been participating in the annual MAVA Leadership One presentations. So Leadership One is uh, a program, a leadership program that MAVA uh, oversees. It encourages teachers to become administrators, department heads, whatnot, and oftentimes leads to their administrative license. And on their first session, uh, the officers go down and we talk about current practices and just leadership topics and really trying to kick off that whole cohort on the, on the way to put. <clears throat> And I'll add, um, just for more uh, context, uh, the, under the proficient rating, um, to help better understand this standard that um, it's a strong communication skills evidenced by regular, regular and informative outreach to staff and families and community members and the school committee for us, the Board of Trustees, um, in a manner that advances the work of the district and regularly seeks and considers feedback and decision making. Um, yeah, I think this is, this, for me, this is harder to um, mm -hmm. discern your role from Mr. Bianca's role in a one school district, mm -hmm. right? Because, There's a lot of overlap. Yeah, yeah, in this one more than I think in, in the others, yeah. Um, so these are the four standards. We'll move on to the goals now, and you'll see the goals are, are more specific, but um, as Dr. Bonner pointed out, maybe not as specific as we might make them in the next round with really clear benchmarks. We're, we're on our way there, but yeah. So goal number one is, um, this is under family and community engagement, right? And so um, 
profession. It engages in regular two-way culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance. It's uh, provided in multiple formats and reflects understanding of and respect for different families, home languages, culture, and values. So Dr. Lincoln Hooker's specific goal is that by June 2024, 17 monthly newsletters will be shared with families and the community highlighting various aspects of SBAHS, including academics, vocational programs, student supports, athletics, cooperative learning, and informative articles educating the greater community around Chapter 74 and career and technical education. Newsletter will use a SMORE platform enabling easy translation and data analysis to better understand those that read the newsletter and adapt or read the newsletter and adapt the newsletter for greater impact. Okay. So the evidence, um, 11 newsletters went out out of 16 potential school ones. So did not quite meet that 17 uh, newsletter goal. And uh, one improvement was this past summer uh, at the summer at having planning retreat, we actually went through and brainstormed topics uh, to, to include in the newsletter, which definitely helped this, this current student. <clears throat> and prior to this goal being that there were no new sites. Right. Right. There's a new initiative. And that including the, um, the your admin team in identifying the topic as maybe an example of some shared decision making. Right. And so for the goals, um, we will rate, you see the rating is a little bit different, did not meet some progress, significant progress, met or exceeded. So, goal two. Uh, the superintendent uh, demonstrates strong interpersonal, written and verbal communication skills as evidenced by regular and informative outreach to staff, families and community members and the school committee in a manner that advances the work in the district and regularly seeks feedback and considers feedback and decision making. So this is under the professional culture standard. Um, and the superintendent's specific goal was that by June 2024, 18 of the monthly superintendent's report to the Board of Trustees will include specific information that informs the Board of Trustees of current units of instruction, projects, and topics within the academic and vocational programs. This shared information will assist the Board of Trustees in accepting a budget and creating or updating program policy. Where do we come up with the, these numbers of 18? The superintendent did. In the, I, yeah. He sets his own goals, and this is what educators in the district do also. Okay. They set their own goals for their professional practice. Okay, so the first goal one was 17. Yeah. This is 18. Yeah. There's only 12 months in a year. So it's good. a two-year evaluation cycle. And okay, we've got thank you. You're welcome. And we've yeah. got school for 10 out of the 12 months. Okay. And we started the evaluation process in October, I believe. So all right. So we have a late start, so, which is why okay. we send it. So it's two, years. all right. Yeah. That's what was, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So the evidence, uh, in addition to the superintendent reports, uh, also fell at 15 school spotlights, as an example, uh, this evening you, you heard from um, plumbing and electrical. Uh, there's been 15 of those school spotlights showcasing vocational and academic programs, cooperative education, athletics, IRCs, NCAS, etc. Uh, so those weren't specifically in the superintendent's report, but they were showcased at the, yeah. the trustees' meetings. Uh, multiple superintendent reports, uh, including lessons and demonstrations of student learning, uh, as I, I shared under standard one. Uh, so those were shared within the, the superintendent's report. <clears throat> um. And I want to point out that you also changed the format of your superintendent report to align with the, the standards of the evaluation, right? So, yeah, your, last year it was mostly just highlights, right. so it got mixed in, and, and this year was broken down by the four standards. Anything on that goal, folks? Okay. okay. So this is our third and final goal. And, uh, the superintendent added this um, last July, uh, and this is under I think management and operations, the standard. Um, understands superintendent understands and complies with state and federal laws and mandates, school committee policies, collective bargaining agreements, and ethical guidelines, 
and provides the resources and support to ensure district-wide compliance. Um, so the superintendent's specific goal was by June 2024, the policy subcommittee will have been reestablished and priority policies will have been identified to review or create in order to ensure policy coherence related to the hiring, retention, and benefits of all school personnel. Since that goal has been created this year, uh, we've had seven policy subcommittee meetings, and uh, so far two policies have been uh, put forward to the trustees for both. All right, sorry. Uh, what were those numbers, sir? It's on the right right space. Oh. Okay. Uh, lost me. All right, all right, yeah, all right. I didn't, I didn't catch this part. Okay. If I so may then, ask it. If yeah, all right, all right. So, yeah, okay. so I know that Perfect. you've been meeting and you worked on two policies, but I'm sure that there's some that are still in the list. Yes, that, that you actually begin to look at that yeah. you may have not brought forward. Do you know approximately how many that is or how many that are? I didn't, bring, I didn't bring my um, policy subcommittee folder with me um, where we generated a list of them. I would say there were probably 15 on them. And I, I would say that some of them that we do bring to the board, but we did address and resolve. We were like, oh, you know, we, does this, do we need to do anything with <coughs> And some things were on, like the, um, some things were probably regulation this in terms of just making some changes yeah with the yeah. internal operations right and like with the like with the michelle Kipersky. right that fund where it's not a it doesn't have to come to the board to expand the review committee for the disbursement of the funds right so um uh, yeah i would say there were probably 15 on our list and we've tackled half of them at least more than half two thirds I can find that. But here is another good example of benchmarks that we can use going forward. So that would we would have to, we would want to identify ahead of time how many need review and how many is reasonable to review. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So where we go from here now is to take this home and digest it and up. Is it, it's totally fine for folks to reach out to me if they have questions or want some guidance or, okay. Now how do you collect this information from us so that we'll have any time for the July meeting? Can we, um, we're allowed to do it through email if they individually email. Oh, but it's, they've got physical paper. So they could bring it to um, Ms. Carver's office by a certain date. I don't need, a, I don't think I need a lot of time to look at this. But one thing, I don't know if we can do it at home on our own, but I do really want us to pay attention to the ways in which we supported the superintendent in um, meeting the standards and the goals. Um, so to ask folks. Yeah, that's my that. big question mark. Uh, what have I yeah, done. done to support that? Yeah. I mean, it just seemed like a train in motion and, and, and it's mm -hmm. moving and yeah. and we're we're here being supportive yeah. but what did we actually really do yeah good, good. that's great question yeah um i really think this was a lot to add into a trustees meeting i would recommend that if we we're going to have another one of these that yeah. we do it separately yeah because this is way too much and we're way too no, not that you're doing a great job, doing a great job. Yeah. But it's adding on. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, we can either ask for a special meeting that needs to be posted. Definitely. Yeah. Do it yeah. that way. It has and to be it has to happen in public at a trustee's yeah. meeting. And we can yeah. we can post it and have a meeting yeah. but start it at five o'clock just for this purpose. Yeah, sure. And then we can you know, wrap it up whatever it takes. It won't be for two years. Okay. I'm just saying about finishing. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this is our first stab at it, so we're we're learning too. Definitely. All of us. I, I mean, I, I was for sure, along with Dr. Lincoln, which no. was a good good partner to to learn with for sure. I appreciate that um, your just availability as a um, as a partner with us. Do we have a due date? Um, Ms. Carver. 
Oh, a week. Dr. Bonner was suggesting 10 days. Right. 10 days. Is 10 days enough time? Uh, what's a week before, what's the date for a week before our July meeting? July the meeting 16th. July 23rd. The 16th is the week before. And the date, so that's even a whole month. You don't want to lose the momentum. Momentum. I don't. You want to stick with the 10 days? Yeah, how about 14 days? 14 days? Okay. Okay, what is, what's that date, two weeks from today? June 25th. June 25th. June 25th. Okay. All right, so the next BOT is the 23rd? Of July. Correct? Yeah. July. So you'll all drop off, it, and it's totally fine to be to have written however you want to have written on these rubrics. You'll drop them off with Ms. Carter, and I'll pick them up and compile them. And um, Ms. Carver, I'll lean on you to uh, remind folks as needed. Well. I know this took a lot of time, and you might want to um, throw some eggs at me now, but the idea no, of, a, not now. of a summer <laughs> retreat, I want to throw it out there because it'd be great to get it on the calendar and for it thinking maybe we're not having an August meeting. Maybe we'd want to find a couple hours in July. I, I'm open to the, the idea. Just like we did at the last time, yeah, yeah, we yeah. did a half a day or yep. started yeah. Yeah. Lunch lunch and, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, suggest the yeah. date. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you, you want it? Let's start with the mail. So, so we're thinking a weekday. Yeah. Can, sure. Yeah, it's got to be a weekday, okay. not a weekend. Um, not during the summer. So I'm. So I actually won't be at the July meeting. So I'm. I'm not here from the 18th to the 26th, and Dr. Bonner and I are going to be there. So I don't know what day the first three weeks. Then not available. In July. In July. Okay. okay. So we're. I looking, know you're shaking your head. Yes. We're looking at the end of July because of August. Yeah. What? what what was that? End of July, beginning of August. Well, the mayor probably has the most full schedule here. Yeah. Probably right back. Um, I could do the 29th, the 30th, 31st. I, the 30th is the administrative retreat. Is that two two main meetings for you if we had it on the well, other side? Of the I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the yeah. 30th would not But just checking. Yeah. One side or the other, you wouldn't mind that? So, what are the, that's the 29th or the 31st? Is that what you said? How would you go? What days are those? Oh, Monday, the sorry. Ones. That's the yeah, Monday. Monday, the 29th of July, or Wednesday, the 31st of July. How do they look through? And what do, you, what do you think in like 8 to 12? We did we did like 12 to 3, I think, yeah, with lunch at noon. And yeah. just I just, okay. Um, Are you available both those days? I will make myself available. Um, I, that's, I don't have my work calendar here, and I, that's an unknown at this point. Um, yeah, either, either one's fine. Dr. Bonner? Okay, right now. Mr. Kaling? Yep. Okay. So what's your preference, the 29th or the 31st? And of course, Dr. Lincoln, you already said you could do it Yeah. Um, I'd say the 31st. Okay. okay. So you want to Wednesday, August 31st, or July 31st, from 12 to 3, with lunch here. Will it be here? Here, yeah, we'll have lunch, and we'll have only one thing on that agenda, and that is strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. All right, so that's uh, what are we calling it? Retreat, Retreat. strategic planning. Yep. Retreat. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Are you getting a sense of what how I'm affected by the community? <laughs> I got you off. You're hired. <laughs> Put this date on your calendars after that long. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's fine. That's mm -hmm. right. Wrap up yep. Okay. So, future business July 23rd, 20, 2024, regular board of trustees meeting here at 5 o'clock. 
Thank you. October 17th, regular board of trustees meeting here at 5 o'clock. October 15th, regular board of trustees meeting here at 5 o'clock. And I refer to Dr. Bonner about a motion to adjourn. Ah, there it is. Second. 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 Second.